This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Hope you're well. Welcome to an episode featuring the great Mike Browning from Nocturnus, or Nocturnus AD as they go by these days, and Morbid Angel. Now, the catalyst for the conversation, it's twofold. I'm a huge Morbid Angel fan, so there was plenty of things I wanted to get to the bottom of, and I felt as though Mike would have the answers to many of my questions. Indeed, he does. He really goes there here, and there's not really any topics that are off limits. You'll hear about the formation of the group and what happened when David Vincent got involved in the outfit and the changes that brought about. When it comes to Nocturnus and Nocturnus AD, um, yeah, we should have had a death metal band for the ages. And I think we do to an extent, but you'll hear why Mike was strong-armed into relinquishing the vocal role in Nocturnus AD. So Mike was the original vocalist and drummer, a role that he did concurrently in Morbid Angel, and he did that as well with the across the first Nocturnus album, The Key. And then for Thresholds, yeah, he was strong-armed into bringing in a vocalist and it changed everything, more or less broke up the band, actually. So we discussed that. So this is a huge deep dive into the history of two of the most important bands in death metal. Mike's a tremendous fella, great guy to talk to. We actually were texting each other for a fair bit afterwards too, so he's, uh, he's very genuine. Now this chat, first of all, it took place in April 2020, just as the lockdowns kicked in. So yes, it's a legacy episode. I haven't shared it on YouTube before, so here it is. Okay, are you ready? Here is the great Mike Browning. How's things been for you? I mean, you released that that excellent. We'll get to well, you know just just chat about things in general to begin with because you did release that excellent album last year, Paradox. I really enjoyed that album, by the way. It was an album on, that I own very few albums on cassette, but I really enjoyed listening to that on cassette for some reason over Thanks. the MP3. It just has that quality. Yeah, yourself and. Um, and Lee Harrison from Monstrosity, the album that he released too in 2018. I love both of those albums, actually, I've got to say. But, but mate, you know, you, you're working and you, you're still putting out music, mate. So <laughs> what's been happening in your world lately? Um, well, it's kind of funny. The, the the thing about that album is, you know, we've, we've been doing the band for a few years now. Um, mm. When I changed it from After Death to, to Nocturnus AD, and we wrote our first song, you know, and, and we actually played, I think, five or six of those songs when we played in Australia a few years ago. Yes. And some of those songs we had never even played out before, but we did two shows there in Australia and, and, and in the same place in two nights in a row. So we played two completely different sets um, both nights. So we, you know, in order to have enough songs to do all, mm. you know, Nocturnus and Nocturnus AD stuff only, we actually, you know, brought out a bunch of new songs, you know, that ended up on Paradox that we were, I mean, some of them we had, I mean, literally just had written, you know. So some of these songs that are on Paradox are a couple of years old now, maybe even three, four years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, like the instrumental, we literally wrote that like the, the two weekends before we went in to record. Sure. And we didn't even really have a, a formulated really good version of it that we had practiced, you know, when we went in the studio, we just kind of winged it and, and, uh, you know, added to it. <laughs> so some of the stuff on paradox has been around for a couple of years. And then some of it was like, you know, brand new, basically like six of the songs were we've had for a little while. And then like the other, the other, you know, well, basically three were really new. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Um, look, no, it's a, it's a killer lately, album. And, yeah, you're right, you go. I was just saying, lately, we haven't been doing anything. <laughs> um, the last couple, we usually, of course. Um, <laughs> because everybody's got jobs and things like that, we usually only practice on Saturdays. Um, so the last two Saturdays, we haven't even gotten together with all the stuff that's been going on. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I thought I thought it was, uh, look, 
as an album, I thought it came from out of the blue, to be honest with you. I mean, I knew you were kind of uh, active, but I didn't realise that you had another album in you. And I thought I thought it was – I actually think it's a classic album from in your pantheon of work, which is really saying something. We'll get to all of that eventually. But it's definitely one of my faves of the, of the past few few years. But do you think that the album – did it reach the years of – people like myself, you know, died in the wall, morbid angel, nocturnus fans that really want, really do appreciate the work that you've done. Do you think it reached, because you've got a global fan base, you're one of those fellas that does have fans all over the world, Eastern Europe, South America, Europe, Australia, of course. Do you think it reached all of the years that it needed to? Um, well, you know, it can always do better, you know, but I think it did really well. Uh, you know, like I was kind of used to what we've been going through with after death. I mean, we put out, you know, a few demos and then we put out the retronomicon thing that was like a collection of all those. And, you know, mm. it sold a few thousand and, and, you know, so I, I wasn't sure what was going to happen with this. You know, I, I, I know we have like a base audience that's not huge, but it's good. Yeah, And so I was expecting it to do okay, but then it got released and just like took off like crazy. And, and, um, you know, the, all the first pressing of the, the albums, the cassettes mm-hmm. and the CDs are gone and they were gone within like two months. And the record company was like, we weren't expecting this, you know? So he, he actually had to do second pressings of everything. That's cool. Except for That's the cassettes. Correct. He wanted to he wanted to make the cassettes and and funny thing about the cassettes is there was only like I believe 300 of those made. And he wanted that to be a special special thing. Mm. So, you know, when I was like, "What about the cassettes?" He's like, "No, I don't want to do another edition of the cassettes." So, if you have a cassette or if you can find one, that is going to be the rarest thing of them all. Um, you know, the colored mm. vinyl, everything, everything sold out like right away. And um you know, especially the colored vinyl and stuff like that. And the CDs, he had to go into a second pressing of those, you know, and, and, you know, he right. wasn't ready for all yeah. that. So, I mean, um, and, you know, being over there, I mean, his biggest band was Portal, of course, mm-hmm. on his label on Profound Lore. Yeah. So, you know, um, in fact, when we played there in Australia, I got to talk to the guys from Portal. And, and you know, he he was the one that told me how good Profound Lore was. And he's like, you know, okay. we've had every label you can think of try to, you know, say, hey, you know, when you're when you're done with Profound Lore, come to our label and do this and that. And he's like, nope. He goes, I didn't want to leave that label because they were so good, you know, to us. And I thought, wow, that's that's saying a lot, you know. These days, most people end up hating their labels, mm. and, and 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 to have somebody speak so highly of a label, when we put out we put out one. We recorded actually like six demo songs, mm-hmm. and we only put one out just to see what would happen. And it took off like crazy. And and um, you know we actually had, and we put it on YouTube and on Facebook, and that was it. I didn't send even one copy out to a label, and we had like seven or eight labels write us right off the bat. And, and I kind of told some of them, well, we want this, this, and this, you know, I I wanted, I wanted a video really bad, a one song video. And when I told most of the labels dropped right off, well, we can't afford that. I'm thinking, well, if you guys can't afford a couple thousand dollars for us to do a video, what can, you know, that's not good. Mm -hmm. I, 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 but I didn't want to be on a label that had a 30 page contract either. Mm-hmm. and signed your life away and, and your songs away and things like that, you know? So when Chris from profound lore, you know, wrote me, he, 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 he said how much he liked it. He was actually a fan of the old nocturnal stuff. And he gave me his phone number and we talked for like two hours. The first time we talked on the phone and every idea I gave him, he was just like, that's awesome. You know, that's what you need. That's what you want, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, so it, it was just like, we clicked really well. And yes. so far, he has done every single thing that he said he would do. That's great, mate. I'm, I'm so glad you found a home for your musical vehicle because I think it's important that you keep making music. And I'm going to I'm going to go on a bit of a monologue here because I think it's important. You you know that fans around the world. I mean, I've I've done almost actually well over 500 interviews at this point, and I know we first started talking about getting you on the show about 12 months ago or so. But you know, you must understand you you're one of those guys who has had a tremendous impact 
and a lot of critical acclaim. And I'm sure you get a bit of that feedback. And I know you haven't had a lot of the commercial success that David and Trey and some of the other guys have gone on to have. But look, alongside of Cam Lee, Chuck Schuldiner, the Tardy brothers and Trevor Perez, and of course Trey, you're the guy that forged the sounds that can be identifiably labelled as death metal, and you continue to do it to this day. So without your contribution, death metal, it might have evolved, yet it wouldn't sound the way it does today. That's how, how important your role has been in its development. Now, of course, that can be attributed to one album, which is the 986's Abominations of Desolation uh, with the nascent Morbid Angel. I don't think a lot of people realise that you had such a heavy hand in writing that album there. Of course, the album, as I say, was recorded in 1986 and released a few years later in 1991. But nevertheless, it's actually the first album recorded, certainly as far as I'm concerned, that can be identifiably labelled as death metal because it came out before Scream Bloody Gore. Now, I, I've spoken to Jeff Becerra, and I, I agree with him on the call that I had with him that that they might have been the first aesthetically death metal band, but I... I I'm just thinking that the Possessed were mining a sound that basically sounded like thrash metal's violent cousin with Jeff's rasps over the top. And the key issue that I think a lot of people have with the Possessed is that the drumming is very primitive and it's very punk-like. Yours isn't. Yours has a lot of variation and you developed a technique, as I say, that is still being heard to this day. And that's my point there. And that's really what cements um, your legacy is that the new bands, I mean, I'm getting up to 20 albums a week sent to me from all the all god knows what labels and what bands are sending them through to me but half of the stuff in the underground sounds like you the drumming style and the way that they're singing because that's, that's 35 years later if you can believe it you know so um i know that's 35 years ago and you weren't with trey uh, you're only with trey for that that relatively small period of time but you know you went on to establish your legacy through nocturnus and now you, you continue to do it through paradox and nocturnus ad I've said a lot there, but is there anything that you you disagree with what I've just said there, or have you got any further comments on that? No, but it, it, do, it does. I, I think you really pretty much nailed that. But to me, it's so weird because you know I met Trey in high school, and we were just two. You know, I was in twelfth grade, and he was in eleventh grade. I was like almost eighteen when I met him. I was like seventeen, mm. and he was like sixteen, and we just wanted to play some weird stuff, you know. And, and, uh, you know, we started out with, um, or, no, no originals right off the bat. We had, you know, we were doing cover songs like Judas Priest. And, uh, I remember we did like lights out in London songs like that. Um, we played, uh, our high school talent show was the first show we ever did. Hmm. And, and the band was called ice Den, and, and that was, a uh, Trey pretty much always did come up with, uh, the, uh, the names for the band. Like he came up with ice. It was supposed to be like, you know, the abyss, the cold, icy abyss. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. And so, so it was weird. Like I had been in the high school for, for the whole time, you know, I, I'm from 10th grade and he was like a new student that came in. Um, he had moved to my, my side of town and he joined the school like, you know, that year. So I didn't know him before this. And he was just like this new student and he had long hair and I had long hair and, you know, there was a place, um, called the alley where people who, you know, partied kind of hung out on the side mm-hmm. of the school. So we kind of met there and we started talking about music and there was li- literally where I went to school, <clears throat> I was like one of the only metal heads in the school. I mean, people yeah. like, there was a few people that were into black Sabbath and stuff like that, but my high school plant high school was generally known as a preppy kind of school back then. Yeah. That'd be the word you would use back then. That's so, true. I mean, there was literally only a handful of people that, that had long hair back in like 1980, 81, you know, in that school. So it was kind of weird when Trey came in and then we started talking about this and that. And, you know, I, I had already been into the occult and he was, you know, in, into the occult and the Necronomicon. I was into it. And this is like, wow, no way. You know, there's a guy just like me that just moved here, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, things, things worked really well and we clicked and, you know, we started the band and I think we only played maybe three or four songs at, at that first show. Cause it was just, it was just a talent show. So yeah. it wasn't like we did a whole concert or anything like that. There was other, you know, performances that night, people doing stuff on stage. And after that he moved again and I didn't see him for a little while. And that's when he had hooked up with Dallas uh, 
and some other people that he jammed with a little bit. Mm. And I hooked back with them. He had a singer and Dallas was playing bass and they had a drummer and they had went through a couple drummers, I think in, in that, in that about six or eight month period. Mm. And they had a, an older drummer from Lakeland, um, which is like about an hour, well, 45 minutes from Tampa. And, and he really wasn't kind of getting this stuff. And I had said the singer that we had, uh, he kind of sounded like the Cyrus Ungle guy, a very distinct, weird voice. And so uh, Trey and I hooked back up again, and he asked me if I would want to join the band, you know, join back into it. And I said, yeah. sure, you know, because I, I, they were doing all originals almost at that point. I mean, we, you know, they were doing some Fate, Merciful Fate, and some uh, Angel Witch, basically just a few covers. Um, mm -hmm. and they were, but they were concentrating mostly on original. So I was like, this is great. You know? So I, I was like, okay. Yeah. So we started jamming and the singer ended up getting arrested for drug trafficking and he went to jail <laughs> for a long time. Yep. And, and, uh, yeah, there's a tape that's, uh, there's a bootleg on, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a website somebody made for abominations of desolation. Is that and right? It has all okay. kinds of stuff on it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think it's still around. And, and, uh, I had ran into the singer, um, Charles was his name. And he actually gave me a couple tapes that he still had somehow from back then mm. that he had put on to, to CD. So it was just us kind of jamming these songs and the band was called death watch at the time. Mm -hmm. And I believe Trey came up with that. Maybe, um, I'm not sure if that was his name or not, or Chuck's Charles, um, the singer, but but when he went to jail, um, basically, we were like, what are we going to do? So Dallas actually started singing, the bass player. So we kind of became a three-piece, and then we called the band Heretic at that point. And we found out there was a Heretic, and this would have been, what, 1985. So we found out there was, or 84, actually, probably late 84, early 85. And we found out there was a Heretic, I think, out in California mm -hmm. already. And uh, so we, that's when it became Morbid Angel. <clears throat> so okay. that's kind of how, how the history of the situation happened. And um, we were a three-piece for a really long time. And we did shows with no vocals. We did, you know, like we used to just go places with a generator. We'd go rent a generator and like set up at the beach and just yeah. play. That's killer. Yeah, that's, that's so, great DIY. Yeah, yeah. 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 And we, parties and stuff like that and we didn't even have any vocals for a lot a long time <laughs> mm. so we started trying out you know singers and um, i'm sure you heard, heard that one cd called the beginning that was a guy named kenny that we had tried out because he said okay. he could sing like king diamond and and you know so and he had a friend that had a studio so we went in there and recorded a couple songs and uh i think you probably heard that welcome to hell's on there okay. and yep. a couple other things um there's like three songs we did i believe it was and Kenny, basically, he was like a lot older than us, and he really wasn't into the kind of things we were into. And but he had a like you know huge PA and light system, and so we you know we tried to work it out, but he just was too different from us. Mm -hmm. But what had happened was um, when we went in the studio, his friend's studio to record. It was the first time we were ever in a studio too. Um, basically, Dallas kind of knew the way the words went. So he did a couple versions singing. So Kenny could kind of pick that up. Mm -hmm. So, and then Kenny did a couple versions and Dallas did the backups. And, you know, once we got the recording and listened to it, we we're like, yeah, this, this isn't going to work. You know, these vocals just don't go. And you know, so we took kind of told him that it just wasn't fitting. Right. And when we heard Dallas's vocals, it was kind of like, Hey, this kind of works. So mm -hmm. that's when Dallas started singing the songs. And I, we did a couple shows with Dallas singing and then I kind of convinced Trey cause Trey loved to do leads all night long and there was nothing wrong with that, but it was just a lot of just, and at that point it was just drums and bass and leads. <laughs> so I kind of convinced him that we needed to get a second guitar player yeah. and then we had dueling leads and all that kind of stuff, harmonies. And he finally agreed. And, um, uh, there was a, house in Tampa that this band called power surge owned. And, um, they used to ha have these huge parties and there was a guitar player there named Richard Burnell <laughs> that I met at one of the parties. Yeah. And he was kind of like really into like what we were doing. And 
So I, I convinced Trey to have him try out for us and he tried out and that's uh, so he ended up joining the band and we were already morbid angel when that happened. Like, and we, you know, we had a little bit of following a local following then. Mm. So, you know, Richard joined the band and then he started trying to sing as well. So we were going to actually have like two different kinds of singers and there's the, the power company show. If you, if you've ever heard that bootleg, that live bootleg, um, uh, it was at a bar called the power company. Okay. Uh, they were both singing, but what would happen with rich at the same, same time. So he kept stopping every time he'd go to sing, he'd stop playing guitar. Okay. And yeah, so that wasn't really working too well. So, and Dallas was doing pretty good, but then Dallas ended up, uh, he was into drugs pretty bad and he ended up going to jail for quite a while too, because of that. So here we were again, stuck with, you know, just me and Richard and Trey at that point. So we got another bass player, but he wasn't really a, you know, a singer. Mm -hmm. So at that point it was just like, I was kind of fed up with trying people and doing this. And I said, you know, I, I used to listen to Exciter a lot. And I was like, yes. you know, I'm going to try to sing and play drums. So I tried it and it just, because I was so familiar with the music and the words as well, mm -hmm. um, it just kind of clicked and it worked. Mm -hmm. So I started singing and then that's when I actually started writing some of the lyrics as well so that I could, Trey wrote most of the lyrics, but stuff like Chapel of Ghouls, if you look at the songs um, back then, the more satanic kind of songs, I, I'd like Hellspawn, yeah. uh, Demon Seed, Demon Seed and yeah. Chapel of Ghouls. Uh, those are basically my titles and lyrics. But Trey right? wrote some of uh, some of Chapel of Ghouls, not uh, but like Hellspawn and and Demon Seed. I wrote all the lyrics and came up with the titles. I was sort of more towards the satanic stuff, and Trey was actually more into the Necronomicon stuff back then. But if you if you look at those lyrics for a lot of those songs, they're straight out of the Necronomicon. <laughs> oh, is that and right? I, okay, you know, yeah. I haven't read it actually. A lot of yeah. it is is you know a lot of it is you know, spells and stuff right out of the Necronomicon. So, mm -hmm. you know, we did that and, and we, we had, uh, did a couple live shows and I had a friend of mine that had moved to North Carolina from Tampa. He was in a brand, he was a singer. His name was Mike as well. And he called me up one day and said, Hey, I'm in this band with this guy named David Vincent and he's got a record label called Goric Records. So I was like, and he's like, he's looking to sign you guys. And he really likes Massacre a lot too, you know, mm -hmm. cause we did a few shows with Massacre. Yeah. Ken Lee. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Right. And so back then, you know, David wanted to sign both bands. So he sent us, you know, so we sent him that little demo of us, you know, live basically from the power company mm -hmm. and he sent us a contract. And so we signed the contract and we went to, uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, and recorded the album. We we went into the studio, and it was a country music studio. The engineer there had no clue about what we were about, the kind of style of music, anything. But David had actually hired um, Bill Matoyer, who was, Slayer. you know, I don't know if you know yeah. who Bill is. Yeah, Slayer, but, yeah. but he he. Yeah, he did Slayer. He did worked on the Metallica record. You know, he he he's done Lizzie Borden. I mean, I, I couldn't even. The list is is, is longer than my age <laughs> <laughs> of bands that he's done. So so you know, it, it was just. And even back then, he was still very well known. He did most of the Metal Blade stuff, and and um, so he was actually hired to do the engineering for the record, and he came from California to do that. So we recorded the songs in uh, like four or five days. And all of a sudden at that point, David goes, okay, everybody go home except for Trey and we're going to mix the record. I'm like, what? You know, that wasn't the deal. You know, I thought that we were going to be there the whole time to do the whole record. Yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden out of the blue, it's like, nope, you guys go home. You three go home. I'm just keeping Trey here by myself and uh, me and him and, and Bill are going to mix the album. So I was like, wow. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. so that's what happened. And I'll tell you when Trey came back, he was a different person. He, he was not exactly, he was not the Trey that I knew 
when I left. It was mm. very strange. And I had found out, come to find out, that David had just fired their guitar player in his band, and they were looking for a guitar player. Um, David had a band, I think it was called Baron Cemetery or something similar to that. Mm -hmm. And like I said, my friend Mike was actually singing for David's band back then. And Wayne Hartzell, who played on the Thy Kingdoms Come songs, uh, mm -hmm. drums, he was David's drummer. David was playing bass, Mike was singing, and they actually had from Hallow's Eve, Skeletor was playing guitar. And they had just fired Skeletor, and they were looking for a new guitar player. So when David met Trey, <laughs> he's like, this guy's going to be my guitar player. I'm going to steal him from Morbid Angel. Yep. But what he didn't realize was that Morbid Angel was really Trey's band, so Trey didn't want to do that. Mm, but so I did the next he, best thing, yeah. He put the thought in Trey's head. Look, you know, I've got all this money. I've got a backer, you know, has a ton of money. As you know, you know, you'd have a place to live. You'd have everything you want if you came here and joined my band. And Trey still didn't want to do that at that point. I mean, after we recorded the record, I know there's a lot of things that say Trey wasn't happy with the record, but that's not true because there's recordings after, you know, like that, that, Rocky Point show was done sure. after we recorded the record. Okay. Um, there's a there's a, uh, a a popular bootleg out that some guys from uh, uh, that Megawimp magazine in Europe recorded mm -hmm. when we got Sterling as the bass player. And uh, Trey was going on and on on the recording. You can hear him about the album and this and that, you know, and how the new songs we have were even heavier. So anyway, well, what happened was when Trey came back, he told me, uh, well, David really hates your, hates our bass player. And, and he wants us to fire Johnny because we got this bass player named Johnny after Dallas went to jail. Mm -hmm. So Johnny, uh, John Ortega was the one who recorded the bass on Abominations. Okay. So like I said, he sent, he sent me and Johnny and Richard back to Tampa and kept Trey there. So besides from him trying to steal Trey at that point, that didn't happen. And Trey was happy with the album when he came back, you know, but he wasn't happy with Johnny's playing on the album. So because he was, because he was told to be unhappy with it or because he was genuinely unhappy with it. I don't really know. See, that's, you know, you'll probably never find out that real answer, Yeah, yeah. but I believe because he was told, and I think at one point David was probably thinking maybe of just joining the band. You know, mm. but in any case, whatever ended up happening, um, he hooked us up with Sterling. So Sterling joined Morbid Angel really because David said, get rid of Johnny and get Sterling. And what we're going to do is we'll re-record the bass tracks when Sterling learns all the songs. Mm -hmm. So that's why the album really didn't get released for a couple months or else it would have been out already before the thing happened between me and Trey later. <laughs> Yeah, because like I said, we played we played two shows. We played a sh the show um, at Rocky Point Beach Resort. We recorded the album in April. We played that show in the end of May, and there's even a little zine that Trey had put out once, and it's got you know the album's coming out. It's got ad you can see there's advertisements for the album mm -hmm. coming out. So at one point, Abominations was set to be released after it was recorded in '86. But like I said, we were waiting um, to re-record the bass tracks. And that's what David yeah. wanted to do because he owned the label and he owned the contract and everything, basically. So he's like, well, it's going to be so much better with somebody else playing bass on it, blah, blah, blah. So we went with that. And then we played another show with Sterling. Uh, and I think that was like in July. I believe it was early July mm -hmm. and we had done some of Sterling songs too. He, he had a bunch of songs from his former band Incubus. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Sterling was like, I'll join Morbid Angel, but I'd like to have my songs, you know, and us doing our, my songs too. And so, you know, Trey agreed when he heard the stuff and we actually on that practice tape reanimators mutilations, which was Sterling song. We played that. And we actually played it at that show too, live. And I sang it. So things were yeah. actually, you know, things were still going pretty well. And then one day I was at work 
and I was driving around and I went to take lunch and I was right by Trey's apartment. So I said, Oh, I'll stop by and see what's up. And I pull up there and my girlfriend's car is there. Jeez. And I'm like, Oh man, you yeah. know? So I went up to the front door of the apartment and I listened to all I could hear that was a TV on. So I literally kicked the door down and, and broke it off the hinges. I kicked it open and there they were on top of each other on the couch kissing. Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't do anything at that point. I just got really upset and left and all this. And, you know, and we had a band house that Sterling and me and Richard lived at. Trey was the only one that didn't live there. Mm -hmm. So I guess he had talked to Richard that day after all that happened. And he said he he was going to quit. Up his equipment. And I, you know, tried to talk him and talk to him about it and, and we ended up getting in a fight and I beat the heck out of them really bad. And, <laughs> Jeez, you know, he yeah, took okay. his stuff home. And then like the next day, Richard told me, well, Trey wants to go up to North Carolina and I think I'm going to go with him. And, you know, cause Sterling and I were just like, well, Sterling was just like, well, let's just redo Incubus. Those are my songs. You know, I got tons more. We'll write more. And, you know, we got a band already. Hmm. And I was like, okay, you know, might as well. You know, I thought maybe Trey would change his mind. So I, I was up for trying to keep things together as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, or maybe two days later, Richard told me, no, I'm going to go with Trey up there. So that's when Morbid Angel split in half. And that's how he joined up with Wayne and um, David. Yeah, okay. There you go. That explains all of the genesis of it then in the split. God, that's yeah, that's that's yeah. very thorough. Yeah, and and look, when you, I have had, we've had a conversation about this over Messenger. So you know, I've spoken to Trey's mum, and she told me that he has Asperger's. Now, I don't know whether that's as much a, of a, a in the public domain as um, well. I, actually, I don't think it is a part of the public domain. I don't necessarily think I got a scoop, so to speak. But I don't think people understand that about him, and. Is that something that you were aware of when you were hanging around with him all those years ago? Well, you know, it's weird. I just thought he was very introverted. More, I mean, Asperger's wasn't really invented, uh, the name. Mm. Um, they didn't know, or he didn't know that he had it for sure back then, you know. And he was, uh, you know, he would have, I dragged him out of his bedroom, you know, to play that first show mm. in, in high school he would have he, he would have stayed in his bedroom probably and playing guitar, you know, the whole time because he's a very, you know, as most people know, he's a very introverted person. Yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. And I dragged him out and got him playing shows. And I don't know if that would have happened without somebody literally pulling him out of his bedroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the best guitar players are probably in their bedrooms, not on stage. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, look, he's. Oh, look, I've, I've tried to. He's. I think you, apart from uh, apart from Trey, and I actually don't hold out any hope of ever having a conversation with him because I know he just doesn't do the media stuff. You were the last guy in the whole camp that I'd had enough. Apart from Richard, of course, who's long gone. Well, not long gone, but passed away last year. Rest in peace. Um, you were the last guy that I wanted to talk to that had been really, uh, you know, part of the whole Morbid Angel camp, but. I think more so than anything else, you were the guy that was there really encouraging him and really being the catalyst for him performing live from the sounds of things. And I know Asperger's, my, I'm pr we're pretty sure my brother-in-law has it and he's 40 mm -hmm. years of age, never had a proper job. Actually, he just got his first proper job recently. But it's been a bloody struggle, I've got to tell you. Um, I've been around the family for about 13 or 14 years or so, and that entire time, mate, we've, we've had to get him out of a few very tricky and intricate situations. Um, and, um, you know, uh, nothing strange, but we really can't leave him around the kids for too long because he gets frustrated. You know what I'm saying? So right, we, right. it's very, very high maintenance being around him. And I, I imagine if you can answer the question, uh, do you think it was a bit like that with Trey, not in that my his weird around kids or anything like that, like what I'm saying my brother-in-law could potentially have been. I'm not saying that he's anything weird like a pedophile or anything like that at all. It's just that he, he gets frustrated and we have a feeling that he might actually, uh, you know, his volcanic temper might erupt. But Trey doesn't sound like he's like that. He sounds like it's so it sort of manifests as this hyper 
um, intense focus on playing the guitar and also just sticking to himself. Yeah, I think I think you're totally correct on that. He he doesn't he definitely doesn't like go freaking out like all mad or anything like that. You know, going to these rages or anything. He's mm. he's a very calm person. Otherwise, from from when he picks up a guitar, I think if he didn't have a guitar, I don't know. You know, he mm. he, he I think he uses it as his outlet, which is great. You know, because it, it, he he learned it to use it as a tool. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you, when when he first picked up the guitar, he could play like that. You know, it was yeah. it, he was. He, I don't know if it's got anything to do with him having Asperger's um, and just being a little bit of a savant type of type of person. But mm. he was literally one of those people that just picked up the guitar and and knew what to do with it. You know, mm. like there's people that sometimes sit down at a piano and and just play it, and they never took a lesson in their life. Yeah, you know, Trey was that it. type of person when he when he picked up a guitar for the first time. He he kind of, I mean, I know he took some basic lessons, but he he was like he knew what he wanted to do from the beginning. You know, there's and and, and um, that that think, was the thing about him. Yeah, I think he's been very blessed to have the mother that he's got too. That's when I, mean, I had a conversation that went well over for an hour with her. We talked about a number of things that I didn't. Uh, we agreed that I wouldn't put on the podcast episode. Nothing too scandalous or anything like that. But they're things that are exchanged about family members. You don't want as a part of the public domain. And as I say, you're assured, rest assured, nothing scandalous. But I think his mother's been a wonderful support to him. And I think without her, I don't. I don't think he would have made the headway that he has. Uh, through life. No, no. I mean, he's definitely helped him for his whole life. You know, I mean, he's been on his own only probably he got married and was on his own for a little while. Um, but hmm. it, when, when he got divorced, uh, <clears throat> he went right back to living with his mom again. And I think it's the support that she gives him, you know, that, that, that comforts him and lets him be who he is hmm. because, oh, you know, he's not the type of person that would want to work a regular job. And he, you know, I know, I know when they first started with Morbid Angel, they had, they worked at a car wash for a little while up there in North Carolina. I think all of them did. <laughs> and, but that didn't last very long, you know, because they, they got a school bus and got out there and started touring right away. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Trey was, uh, you know, he, he's kind of, he never had, has had a regular job. So, you know, basically he just sits and plays guitar all the time. Mm -hmm. You can and, hear that. Which is, <laughs> you can hear that if he's blind. Yeah, he yeah I mean, there's nobody that plays the way. There's still yeah. nobody that plays the way he does. I mean, people uh, have absolutely. replicated yeah. what he does, but he definitely came up with a style all his own. And and, and if anything, people have just copied that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, and, I, and 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 it's probably got to do with the way he thinks, different than most people. And like I said, the first time he picked up a guitar, he could play like that. I mean, he's obviously honed it and made it better. But if you listen to that stuff back in 85 and 86, he was doing leads that were phenomenal back then. Hmm. Yeah, that's what his mum said, that so, he just picked up the guitar and it just started making sense straight away. And I think she remembered the exact moment when he picked it up over at her brother's house, his uncle's house, and it just started making sense to him. And it's just such an, an incredible gift that he's been given that very yeah, few we, people... We, yeah, right, you go. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, uh, like yeah, I, I think he got the guitar for Christmas basically, hmm. and he had just gotten it. And I remember going over to his house, and he's like, you know, when when we first met in school before we, you know, uh, started even playing together. And I remember him sitting on his bed and just picking up the guitar and just going crazy on it, you know. And I'm like, whoa, this is cool, you know. <laughs> I've never seen anybody yeah. do that before. So, and, and, and I was just like, yeah, we got to get together and do some stuff, you know, and mm. that's, that's the way it worked. But yeah, he literally did just kind of pick up the guitar. I mean, I wasn't there the first time, like his mom was, you know, like, like, like she said, but I was there way in the beginning before he ever yeah. got out of his bedroom with it. And I saw him sit on his bed before he ever got on a stage and just play like crazy leads. And that, and I was like, I love that. You know, he, he has that. Jimi Hendrix style of playing, hundred percent, exactly. Uh, I'm glad you see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 to me, you know, I mean, I grew up in the '70s, so there was no metal in the '70s, really. 
I mean, you know, there was some obscure stuff here and there that you could find if you really looked for it, but it wasn't very easy to find. So, and luckily when I was a kid, there was a record store not too far from my house I used to ride my bicycle to. And the guy there was like big time into getting imports from, from, from Europe. You know, so, you know, he had the first couple Iron Maiden records and things like that. And I was just like, wow, you know, so I was listening to that kind of stuff in high school. Even before Trey got there, I had heard some Iron Maiden and, you know, I was like big time into Sabbath and, uh, you know, Angel Witch, too. When uh, when he brought up Angel Witch, I was like, I know who they are. And, uh, you know, I'd never known anybody. And it was because this guy that owned this little record store on, on by my house, you know, used to get these imports in. And he would actually, the cool thing was he would play them in the store. So I didn't have to just buy the record and hope that it was good. I got to hear it, you know, in the store. And I remember, you know, coming home, you know, like riding a bicycle with an album, you know, (laughs) you know, I didn't even have a car yet, you know, and and I'm on a bicycle carrying a record home through it. And I had literally, I used to set, set the turntable behind my, my my drum set and I literally try to drop the needle onto the record and start playing because you know you didn't have a four count or anything like that when you start a record. <laughs> so trying to learn songs like that way, I, I yeah. had to have the turntable like right behind me. So I'd literally drop it and have these two big stereo speakers on each side of me and try to learn songs that way when I was like 14, 15 years old. That's the way it was done, Mike. That's, but that's why you've got the skills that you've got. This is the fit that, just to digress for a moment, I, being a musician, I'm a musician myself and I grew up very similarly, okay, but listening to cassettes and CDs and trying to stop it and play it and trying to, you know, get my little bass or guitar amp to overpower what was going on with the headphones so I could sort of hear them concurrently. But that, what that did, and I don't think we realised that, of course we wouldn't, how could we, it made made us into very good musicians, I think, being able to, especially from, from a drummer's perspective, you've got an intricate understanding of the beat. And I can't tell you how many drummers I've, I've played with that don't. It's incredible. They just power forward and they're not listening to anybody else. But because you were able to do that, I think that sort of lends a lot of weight to the musicianship that you helped craft through through Extreme Metal's burgeoning era, you know? Yeah, it, it, it probably does. I, I I never really looked at it that way, but that's all we had to do. You know, it, mm. it was either you either had an album or you had an eight track cassette, because even cassette tapes weren't around in the earlier days. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't remember what year a cassette came out for the first time, but I do remember back in the beginning, all there was was albums and and eight tracks. Eight tracks, yeah, yeah. And, and generally, most people didn't have an 8-track in their house. They had it in the car. So you had an 8-track in your car, and you had albums at the house, and that was it. You know, there, it's hard for people to understand that these days, especially the young kids, because they yeah. grew up with a cell phone in their hand. You know, they grew up with touching that cell phone and getting anything they wanted from the Internet. When you had no Internet, you had no cell phones, there was nothing else to do. You know, you didn't even have CDs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, literally, yeah, right. it was, and you listen to an 8-track, and half the time, an 8-track has four tracks. <laughs> so half the time, a song would stop right in the middle and fade out and start back up on the next track. So you mm-hmm. really couldn't use 8-tracks to learn things either. You had to have the album. Yes. And, yeah, and, yeah. and you had to have that turntable right by you, especially if you were playing drums. You know, you have to drop that needle and... and be ready to play with no four count or anything just jump right in and start playing mm-hmm. yep. so that you know if, if you wanted to learn things that was the only way to do it really back then i mean a few people did have reel to reels uh but that was quite a, an expensive that was piece rare, of equipment though. yeah back then. very rare, right yeah. yeah yeah um so yeah after the eight tracks then cassettes came out and things got a lot started changing a lot you know and then of course it went to cd but yeah. uh yeah, back in the beginning, it was crazy. I remember, you know, being on my bicycle carrying an Iron Maiden record back home. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even have a car, and uh, you know, trying to learn that record back then yeah, that sweet. way. Yeah. Yeah. What about just talking? This is the last question I ask you about Trey. But I know he wore a Nocturnus T-shirt in the Gateways to Annihilation sleeve in the photo that accompanied the album. Uh, have you had any meaningful contact with him? Like, would you say that you guys are mates? these days? Well, it's, it's funny. I mean, there was, um, 
it, you know, for a while we didn't talk back then. And, and then when I had Nocturnus going, they moved back to Tampa and they were actually practicing a couple doors down from our warehouse. There was like their warehouse, they had like a double warehouse. Mm-hmm. And then at one time they even had a triple warehouse and there was another band in between us and them. There was like 20 or 30 bands that practice in the same uh, warehouse thing and uh, public storage, they called it. Mm-hmm. And it's still there today. Uh, and so, you know, we started talking a little bit here and there and then Trey really liked Mike Davis is playing. So why you see Trey with a nocturne shirt wasn't really because of me. It was actually more because of Mike Davis. Is that right? There you go. Okay. Gosh. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, I'm, it, it's so if, been anything, written, if anything, oh, it's, it's just yeah, if say, anything, it, they got back. They, Oh, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I did read online somewhere that, um, and I yeah, who knows? I mean, you, you can correct this one or otherwise, but the relationship with the earache actually came about through him, um, and and not you. I thought that was really unusual. Actually, is that the case? Yeah, I mean, it really is. Uh, like they started hanging out quite a bit, and I guess Trey mm-hmm. really liked the the technicality. Mike Davis took a lot of lessons from from a few different people in Tampa, um, there was a, another guy, not Dallas Ward, who was in Morbid Angel, but a guy named Dallas Perkins. He took a lot of lessons from him. And there was another guy, I forgot what his name was, but he took a, several lessons and he would literally take scales and stuff that he learned and turn them into rhythms. So that's how the nocturna stuff sounded like it did. Okay. Uh, so, you know, Trey was like really enamored with his playing and so they started hanging out quite a bit and, and, you know, teaching each other the songs, each other's songs, you know, how, so, because Davis was more of a, uh, a technical player, you know, and Trey was more of a, a heart by the, or soul player, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think, I think when they started hanging out, they kind of traded a lot of their style to each other. Okay. And that's when, you know, Trey yeah. really liked what we were doing because it, it didn't sound like more, of course, Nocturna sounds nothing like Morbid Angel. And, and so I, you know, he didn't look at that as a threat. Like, you know, there were uh, a lot of fans were competing with each other back at that time. Mm-hmm. And to me, I've, I've never wanted to compete with anybody in music. To me, music is very personal and it's got to come from inside. I can't, I don't want to play in a band where people, you know, write songs to make, make bucks, you know, mm-hmm. I could, but I don't really want to, I like doing my own thing. And, and that's basically why I do what I do, you know, because it's got to come from inside of me or else I just don't want to do it. I've got to, I've got to say, so though, I, that I think Nocturnus is an extremely important and overlooked band in, in the pantheon of extreme metals. Greats, you know, but from the outside, and I'd, gosh, I've done a lot of reading on this one here, but it looks as though you were plagued by bad luck and even treachery. I mean, you know, you've even got to call the band Nocturnus AD to this to this day, and it's your bloody band. But do you think that's a reasonable take on things? Do you think there was a bit of bad luck surrounding the band? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what I think. I think I'm just too trusting with people. You know, oh, yeah. I don't. I let people take advantage of me. Is the situation more than anything? I you know, I let people get close and 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 they get jealous for some reason because i'm just i i don't because you've got talent just, you've got I'm a lot me. of talent yeah i get it i actually i know just this there they'll use you to get to the next gig and they'll they'll ask you to apologize for it later. You know what I'm saying? And I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I thought that may have been the case. Hence I asked the question. Well, I mean, I'm not technically, I'm not an amazing drummer. There's a lot of better drummers that can blast better than me and play, you know, I'm kind of sloppy, but, uh, but so is a lot. I mean, look at Jimmy page as a guitar player. He was playing stadiums and messing up all the time, all the time, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. but, but, but that's not what it's all about. I mean, some people want, technicality to where it's perfect. But to me, I would rather watch somebody get up there and play a 20 minute version of a five minute song and just jam like crazy on it. than 
somebody go up there and play a perfect five minute version of that song like it sounds on the album. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean, a lot of people do want to hear what they have on their album and they want it perfect. They want every grunt and groan and cymbal hit exact. But I've never been that type of person. I've always been, man, I, I want to, I want to, you know, improvise a little bit. I want to be able to kind of like open the songs up if I, if I want to. And, and it's so hard to do that. You, you almost can't do that with death metal. That's the problem with death metal. So I've always kind of been against trying to do what everybody else did and compete because mm -hmm. when you compete, all you're doing is trying to better something that somebody else has done. That's what competition mm -hmm. is. When you look at competition, it's taking something that somebody else has done and trying to best it, mm -hmm. whether it's speed or, or scales or playing ability. You're, you're just copying what they did and trying to do it a little bit better. Mm. You know, competition has nothing to do with originality. Originality just is what it is. You know, you either have that or you don't. I, th I think in your case, you're, you're absolutely right. I think for you, absolutely. Because, I mean, any, anybody that out there that considers themselves a fan of extreme metal, if they don't have the key, something's wrong. It's essential listening, in other words, you know. I mean, look, it's an album that, that it's it's raw, but it has an air of sophistication that wasn't present amongst other recordings at that time. You can hear it in modern bands such as Rings of Saturn these days who are sort of borrowing a little bit of your aesthetic and the sound that you pioneered there. But what, what I think, and just to sort of uh, further the point that I made about some of the bad luck, uh, I think its promotion was hampered because you weren't able to extensively tour it. Now, I know you did the 30 or so dates in the US on the Grind Crusher tour. But I don't know whether you were able to really slog it out there in Europe, come to Australia, this sort of thing, in the same way that, say, Bolt Thrower or Carcass. Because I, I feel I tend to sort of, because I'm from that vintage myself, and I got into Nocturnus at about the same time as I was getting into Bolt Thrower and the carcasses of the world, you know, when Nirvana broke big, this sort of thing. And, look, I think when Thresholds came out, it felt like as though you lost a bit of momentum because I think you were still, and I think to an extent you're still feeling the effects of that episode because that was when you were replaced as a singer and you were eventually uh, you exited or kicked out, feel free to correct me or otherwise there, of your own band. But, I mean, I know you've talked about being trusting, but are, are you a bit of a fatalist or do you look back at the Thresholds episode as an opportunity lost given that they brought in a new singer and uh, you eventually left the band? Well, I, I, it, it was a weird situation because I thought things were going great, you know, with mm. the key. And I know, you know, uh, the thing, was, was, the problem that happened, it really started with the label because Earache said, look, you guys don't move around on stage. You got a drummer with a huge drum set that you can't see behind the drum set singing. And there's no focus to the band, nothing for the crowd to focus on, you know, and, and I kind of argued that saying you don't really have to have a front man up there like that, you know, to be good. Mm. And they said, well, the guitar players don't move around, you know, bass player moves around a little bit. Keyboard player, he's stuck behind the keyboards and he just kind of stands there and shakes his head, thrashes a little bit. And the drummer, you can't see him. So they said for the second album, if you want a bigger budget, and if you want a video, because we didn't do a video for, for the key, of course, because there really weren't any videos at that time, hardly at all. Yeah. Um, and Headbangers Ball had just came out, and that was the thing. You know, MTV Headbangers Ball was the thing. And if you were going to make it big, you needed a video on Headbangers Ball. Mm -hmm. and, and Eric said, if you want a video that will be on Headbangers Ball, you need to get a front man. And you need, you know, either you become the front man or get a front man and just play drums. So I, I was against it. I was totally against it. I had already like, you know, everybody knows the key has a story to it. Well, yeah, there's none of that story on thresholds, but I was ready to continue the story for the, for thresholds when I was starting to write. So what happened was, you know, the other guys in the band found out, oh, well, you can get paid more money if you write some of the songs. And, and the thing was with the key, I didn't, I never, even though I wrote, you know, 
basically almost all the lyrics. Davis helped me with a couple of the songs because he had some ideas. And so, you know, I used his ideas and, and filled in the blanks, you know, on, on some of the newer songs. But the thing was, it, it was, it, it, you know, I had a whole bunch of ideas for the second record because I was expecting to sing and play drums. I thought everything was going fantastic. We had done, you know, a tour with Bolt Thrower. It went very well. Mm-hmm. We Then we did the Grind Crusher tour that went really well. But then here's the label saying that we're boring live and we need a front man. So... But was that I, was that I, Al was it was that Al Dawson or was that Dig that said that to Digby Pearson that said that to you? It was Digby. It was Digby. He said it right out. He said, "Here's the thing. You had a you know you had a, a ten thousand dollar budget for the first record. You can have a twelve thousand dollar budget for the second record, or even maybe thirteen. Or it's going to get cut in half if you don't get a singer, mm-hmm. and you're not going to get a video. So they basically told us either get a singer." Or you're 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 gonna your budget's gonna be cut and no video. Mm-hmm. So everybody else was like, no, we can't let that happen. We can't. Let you. And you know, Dream Theater was starting to get popular back then, and everybody was like, oh, we want to be the next Dream Theater, you know, because you know we were doing pretty well with the key, and everybody was like, keyboards, keyboards, you know. Mm-hmm. So they thought if we went with a singer, and and uh, you know. Had had, had, yeah, had I understand more of a the sci-fi theme and yeah. and got rid of the the satanic element in the band and all this that we would get huge. Basically, change yeah, everything about the aesthetics. Next. But change everything right. about the band that makes the band a success, and then you'll be more successful. God, we've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and in theory, you know, it could have worked, but we we could we would have needed to get a singer that actually sang at that point to do that. You know, if we wanted yeah. to take that type of a step, certainly we took that type of step when it came to the lyrics, as you can tell, mm-hmm. the lyrics were completely different on, on, on thresholds than the key and nothing was continued from the key at all. Not even one song was continued. And, you know, all my plans that I had kind of went down the drain. So I got very depressed at that point. I didn't mm-hmm. really even want to be, you know, and everybody, they got so greedy. They wanted to write lyrics. Everybody wanted to write lyrics. Lou, especially the keyboard player. He wanted to write lyrics because he wanted to make more money. He wanted to split our royalties the publishing, by yeah. who wrote, by who wrote what and you know, who came up with what. And that's not my idea with, with the key was we all played on it. We all get paid equally no matter what if, if i wrote every lyric i don't want to make 50 percent of that record i'm still good with splitting everything five ways mm-hmm. and and even with paradox we did that is that right but you, I, wrote you would all have, the I was gonna say you would have written the whole thing i, I wrote all, all the lyrics on paradox and i didn't take 50 percent of the publishing because I, I wrote, you know, when, when you look at publishing and, and checks, you know, the singer, well, well, whoever writes the lyrics could get basically 50% and music is 50%, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes down to being paid royalties. But I didn't ask for that. I didn't want that, you know. Um, so it was basically, I, I was more like, you know, I still believe in everybody splitting stuff because we all played on the record. We all were there for the recording. You know, but a lot of bands don't do that. One or two people make most of the money, and the other people are either hired musicians or just make a portion of it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they even do that live. But if we get, you know, if we make five, say five hundred dollars, and there's five people in the band live, just saying, you know, something easy to split. Yeah, sure. Everybody gets a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Certainly, I'm not going to take, sense, you know, yeah. I'm not going to take half the money and then pay the other guys a small amount to play on stage. That's just, that's not a band to me, you mm-hmm. know? So that's where my trusting comes in, wanting everything to be equal. And people get very greedy when it comes to business and yeah, music. Yeah. And I don't yeah. understand it because you're not a band at that point anymore. Yeah, that's you're, a shame. You're hiring people. You know, yeah. if you want that, that's fine. Go hire a band, you know, to play your songs and you just be the front man or whatever and, and have all these people that you pay. That's not a band to me though. That's just a project. So how you did know? you- <laughs> It's somebody's project. 
so what about the Kickstarter campaign for Thresholds back in 2013? Because I think I think it went pretty well for you, didn't it? So how, how did you negotiate with the ex-members of the band um, that you were going to be releasing that via a crowdfunded platform? Well, basically, the thing was, when we signed the contract with Earache, we signed away our publishing. Mm-hmm. So when Earache wanted to do that campaign they didn't pay anybody royalties, including me. Okay. We haven't seen a royalty. We have not seen a royalty from, from the key or, era, or or thresholds since I saw one royalty check when I was in the band from the key. Now, what happened was with that, and the reason behind that was actually because we got tour support for the key. Mm-hmm. So we got tour support for going over to do the tour with, um, with Bolter Hour, and we got tour, a lot of tour support for doing the um, Grind Crusher tour because on the Grind Crusher tour, we were making $150 a night. Okay, that didn't even cover the gas for the bus, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Much yeah. less the bus, the hotels, the food. We were losing thousands of dollars a day. Mm-hmm. So we never made any money on royalties for the key. I think we saw one small check right in the beginning, but then once we started touring and getting tour support, bam, there was our money. It was gone. So when we went into thresholds, we had, you know, literally debit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> debt, yeah, I understand. Think. Yeah. I, I get where you're coming from now with everything. Yeah. And that, that obviously eroded away at people's confidence because then they're trying to uh, not confidence, it, it 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 eroded away at their ability to want to work within a team because they're wanting to put their financial interests before the other band members. And that's what fostered that environment. Hey, mate, can you hear me? They ended up, they didn't, they, they never made any royalties because they were paying back everything. A lot of people think that people make a lot of money. I mean, I've seen, you know, look up the wealth of, say, say, you know, George Fisher from Cannibal Corpse. Sure. Yeah. You'll see stuff that says he's a millionaire <laughs> on the internet. Playing death metal and becoming guys, a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, it, it yeah, doesn't happen. If, no, exactly. You know, and, and, and people think just because you're playing, like, say, you know, Trey and David, they're not millionaires, but people think they are. But mm. it's not that way. You have so many expenses and tour support really killed a lot of bands back in the day because labels were giving it out like candy and because they wanted their bands to be out there you know and when record sales fell off because of bootlegging and and, you know the internet basically nobody was making any more money on records so labels had to stop giving tour support because they started losing money Mm -hmm. yeah indeed yeah what did you what did you think back then with, with nirvana and pearl jam and all of those bands coming in did they do you think that they, because my own take on it is that they helped open up a lot of doors for extreme metal, especially with Morbid Angel going onto a major label in 1993 via uh, Giant, which I think is a Warner Brothers imprint. Um, but do you think that those bands, they helped you guys? Um, I don't know. You know, that's a, it's a strange thing because I, I never really got into that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and to me, I always liked Black Sabbath and Dio and those bands always made money. They were big already. They were on major labels. So I kind of never really looked at Nirvana and stuff like that in, in that in that sense because to me, I already saw bands that I liked that were heavy that were making lots of money. So yeah, I, to okay. me, I always kind of thought it's possible to do this and make money, but it, it, that wasn't a goal for me. You know, to, for me, it, the goal was to make something that I liked to listen to and that I was pleased with that I could throw some headphones on and, and jam out of my brain too. <laughs> it, it, yeah. I've always had a job, so I've never really worried about paying my bills by playing music. And so to me, that was never even a factor. Of What, what do you do for a living? What's make, the day job? Uh, I, work, I, I work for the water department in Tampa and I've, <laughs> I've worked there for twice I worked there twice I worked there like seven and a half years back then when I was in Morbid Angel and Nocturnus and then I quit for a couple of years and now I, I went back so I've only had really basically that one job for my whole life 
Right, okay, gotcha. What do you do there? Um, well, right now, I've always worked with, with water, uh, like water meters and things like that. I used to read them. Now, mm -hmm. I, now um, when people move in and out, I turn their water off and on, uh, starting accounts, things like that. Um, but it's always been an out-in-the-field job. I've never had an office job. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that probably suits you better, I think, from the sounds of things. Yeah, you know. And, but it is um, a government job, and it's really steady. You know, I mean, I have a pension, I have all kinds of stuff, so I've never really worried about, you know, making ends meet or, or you know, like I, I got to put out another record because I got to pay my bills, you know, that kind of thing. Music never, I never looked at music as an income. I always looked at it as something that I liked to do, and if I didn't like to do it, I, I, I didn't do it. If I liked to do it, I would do it, but it never hinged on me having success. Well, at, you're very sensible. Money. You're one of the few very sensible ones, I've got to say, then, because God knows, I've spoken to Blitz from Overkill about this, and his point was that there's a ton of these idiots sitting in basements hating on the world because the world doesn't understand their genius according to them. You know, and they're not actually got that balance that you're talking about there, which is actually, it all comes down to hard work at the end of the day. I mean, how many times have you woke up in the morning and said, shit, I'd rather lie in bed or do play music rather than go to work? But you've got to go to work, haven't you? That's what, that's just what well, you've got to do. I mean, that's the way I've looked at it. And, 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 and sure, I mean, it's also caused me not to be able to go on big, long tours. But mm. I've found a way to still play shows a few a year I might only play six or seven shows a year but they're big shows now you know they're festivals mm -hmm. and um, I don't know I mean I'm lucky I'm really lucky I, I have to say because not many bands you know when you look at how many metal bands there are out there there's literally thousands and thousands of them and these festivals only get so many bands on there so I have to say I'm, I, I was very lucky being Perseverance with my with my music and keep keep on and keep on like you said mm. there's a lot of work involved in that and just doing it uh, but I really never looked for the reward of it I just did it because I wanted to and and that maybe that gave me the ability to write things the way I do and come up with the ideas that I do you know because I'm not on a timeline with anybody I don't have to make this by this time I don't have to make you know another record because I got to pay rent at the end of the month. I don't have to put out something every couple of weeks, you know, mm -hmm. to make money or be on it playing shows. And I don't overplay our songs, you know, like some bands and it's not a bad thing because they want to survive that way, you know, but literally some bands never get off the road. Mm. You know, yeah. they tour, they tour nine it's or 10 months out of the year. It's constant with some of them. They've just got an album every two or three years or something like that. And to be honest, I tune out, uh, which, which right. makes yours, which is which made which is really what made Paradox such a, a, a pleasant surprise when it was released. Now I'm, I'm on the air split mailing list, so when David and uh, Liz sent it through, um, I was I was thrilled, man. I've got to tell you. So I think you're onto something there, mate. Just keep it as something that that happens every once in a while, and you, and you do those five or six shows a year. And look, you mentioned at the beginning of the call that you did come down to Australia a couple of years back, and it just, I just don't think that show was that well publicised because I only found out about it afterwards. And you can tell I'm a fan, but I'm about two and a half thousand kilometres away from where the show was held down in Melbourne. So I would have had to, to right. fly down, which I wouldn't have had a problem doing. But do you find that that happens a little bit, that you go to a territory and you're playing to 100 or 200 people? And to be honest, that show could have been a, a lot bigger and you, you could easily have played Sydney, for example, and certainly near me in Brisbane. Do you find that that happens after the fact? Yeah, I mean, that does happen quite a bit. And, and, and that is the drawbacks of not being able to tour, you know. Mm. So that it does make a big difference when it comes to that. And that's probably why bands like, or people, I should say like David and Trey and, and, you know, certain people have made superstars out of themselves and I'm still kind of more of an underground person, even though I've been in the same situations. And I think that probably has a lot to do with the fact that I, they never really did tour. And mm. I did, you know, back in Nocturnus days and I lost everything because I, I trusted people and I toured. I lost my job and I lost the band too. Yes. So yeah, I now I'm, I, I do now I do things on my terms, and and it seems to work for me. 
you know, it'd be great to, you know, be able to do this stuff a little bit more than I, than I am doing it. But I think it makes it a little more special because you can't just go see us. Well, I'll, I'll skip this tour, you know, and go see this band instead next week because they, these guys are going to come through next year too. Mm-hmm. You know, you can bet on it. So you can't do that with me. If you don't come see a show, <laughs> you may not see that's, another one. <laughs> that's why I was so disappointed when I found out about the show. Was actually I saw some photos on Facebook of people dressing up in alfoil and tinfoil hats and stuff, and it said Nocturnus AD, and I thought, oh, it must be a tribute show or something like that. But no, there was a photo of you there too, and I thought, oh shit, I missed it. So I might I might have to get up the your way, mate, when uh, Nick's go to the US when you guys have got a show on and watch you guys then. Well, we did play the same club two nights in a row like I said in there in Australia and mm. it was packed yeah there's no doubt it, that it, was, yeah. it was packed I mean the, the club was small but it was packed and the yeah. people were crazy <laughs> I remember there was a guy up front he literally picked up the floor monitor in front of one of our guitar players off the ground and held it over his head listening to it holy shit <laughs> Crazy! <laughs> I've never seen anybody do that before. So I mean, yeah, you, you guys had some definitely great, crazy crowd people there. You know, sometimes those small shows are awesome too. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, the, because the the, the extreme there's a connection there that you get with the crazy. people. I mean, that guy literally walked up to our stage, <laughs> picked up the guitar monitor, and held it over his head, listening to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. right in his face. So, you you know, you don't get that at at a festival, but then there might be 10,000 people watching you at a festival. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely some hardcore extreme metal fanatics in Australia. There's no doubt about that. I, I've spoken to the to Max Cavalera about this. They're very similar to the Brazilians and the South Americans. These crazy Australian fans. They tend to when they're some of the shows. I've got to be honest. I remember going to shows back in the day when I was a kid, like watching Deicide and Cannibal Corpse and stuff. They were fucking scary shows. Like I remember <laughs> Glenn, Glenn, and you know how angry Glenn can get. He it was about to rip a guy's head off because he spat on him. And the same thing happened the week or two before because Cannibal and DSI toured at about the same time with a couple of months of each other or what have you. The same guy must have done it to Corpse Grinder as well who was looking for him in the crowd too. These guys are just the, – the old arena venue there in, in the valley there in Brisbane, dear God, you'd walk into the – to the men's toilets and it'd be full of chicks and not doing anything sexual either. They're just, just being idiots in there. And you'd think, and there's broken glass on the walls and shit. And you think, what the hell? Like, I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated city, but it felt like as though I'd descended into Sodom and Gomorrah whenever an extreme metal show was on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So even, even for a veteran like me, man, there wasn't, I, I don't drink when I go to gigs. You say, oh, I do these days, but back in the day I didn't. Because uh, I used to drive everywhere, but I was one of the only sober people in the audience, I think. And I just watch all this debauchery go on and think, I, I never questioned my love of the music. It's always been there, but I think I don't know whether I want to go to these shows <laughs> or because I feel like as though I'm going to uh, something might happen to my very life. <laughs> you <know? laughs> well, you know that's the thrill of it all. You know that's what makes it what it is. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what about um, Richard Brunel? Uh, unfortunately, passed away last year. But did you have much to do with him over the years, uh, uh, like post Morbid Angel? Well, that, that, um, yeah. The funny thing is, uh, we hooked up a couple of times when I had my old house about ten years ago. We hooked up, and he actually came over a, a three or four times, and we started playing together. Hmm. And we were going to do a band. Uh, uh, back Shit. then, and cool. he was he was just going back to college and trying to get his his stuff back together, and he was starting to fail in college because uh, he was taking engineering. Uh, his brother is an engineer, and it was going to give him a really good job if he could get the license, you know, the mm-hmm. the you know um, from going to college, you know, the the accreditation and everything. Sure. Yeah, and he started kind of failing the classes, so he was like. You know, once I get through with this semester, let's start jamming again. But I need to take, you know, I I, I got to concentrate on this. So kind of, we didn't do anything at that time. We only got together maybe four or five times, and uh, it, it was kind of he was doing some weird kind of stuff. It wasn't really anything like more of an angel, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was some stuff that he had, and. 
so kind of like we started jamming a little bit. And I mean, he kind of had lost his his edge that he used to have when he was in Morbid Angel, though. He he, mm-hmm. he was very beaten down by Trey and and David and 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 drugs, and it took yeah. a toll on him. Yeah, I you know, he wasn't that. the same yeah. person he used to be. He was very, um, you know, oh, you know it's hard to explain you know he was just beaten down by by society basically yeah and and um it 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 was really sad but he was trying you know and then he got back into drugs again i didn't see him for a couple of years and then i ran into him again uh what's really funny is my daughter and me and my mom on a saturday there's this restaurant close to my house like a little deli restaurant we went there to go have lunch and so we, you know, we ordered the food and we sat down. So we're eating the food in the, in, in, in the lobby there of the restaurant. And all of a sudden, Richard walks up to me. And he was working there. And he saw me up at the front desk ordering the food. It was a little mm-hmm. deli. And so he came out and we talked for a little while. And it's right down the street from my house. And he was living right down the street from there. And he was riding a bicycle to work and he was doing better. So I got his phone number and we started talking again. And, and he had this uh, new band called Mosaic Covenant. And he was trying to do some stuff with that. And and um, we were actually talking. And I remember it was his birthday. And he asked me if I would want to play drums for his new project. And I said, sure. You know, why not? Let's do it. You know, and I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool. And then, you know, maybe we could turn into something a little heavier. <laughs> too, you know, I always yeah, want to sure. be optimistic about things. And so we, we were talking and it was his birthday. And then I didn't talk to him for about a week and a half. And all of a sudden I find out, you know, he he was dead. Jesus. So I talked to him. It was not even two weeks before before he had died. And the weird thing was he was doing better. I mean, he was not drinking. He, he was only drinking water. He was working. He had the job for a little while. He was doing really well. So I, and, and, and I guess his sister-in-law and his brother found him in the apartment that he was living yeah. in. And they would not tell anybody what happened. He, to this day, I, I have tried to find out mm-hmm. what happened to him. And they will not say anything. They had no funeral for him, no public funeral. Um, so, okay. yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. And the weird thing was, you know, he seemed to be doing better. And some, somewhere in that last week and a half, something went extremely wrong. Yeah, that's that's bloody awful, mate. You know, it's awful for the family. But I think um, when it was announced that he passed away, uh, I know there was a lot of sympathy for him and and a lot of love for him out there in the community too. Uh, and his contribution to the music, I think he was out of everybody that had a hand in the creation of extreme metal. He was the one guy that I think had been overlooked more than anybody else. But it, it also sounded like, and I think you confirmed a few of the suspicions that I had, that he was really turning himself upside down and inside out to please David and, and Trey to maybe a lesser extent as well. Because I've, I've had a chat to David, and David definitely strikes me as a very ambitious and authoritative type of a guy, you know, my way or the highway sort of thing. And um, I think in that environment, a sensitive soul, no doubt like what, what Richard was, um, can be crushed in that. And, and a lot of that shit stays with you. I mean, I, I remember I went through a boarding school in Sydney and, uh, you know, they, were, they, were, they weren't easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you've got a, a dominant character in a group of... Uh, well, he was always being told that he was not good enough. He was not good enough to play the rhythms. You know, uh, yeah. on the first album, uh, on Abominations, he plays leads and rhythms. And, and uh, I think he did on Alters as well. Uh, but I know I'm blessed and covenant that he was not allowed to play rhythms, uh, that only he, he only played leads. That's bizarre. So, yeah. Yeah. I wonder what the, yeah, wonder what the reasoning behind that was. I mean, he, he, he would have, I, don't, I wasn't in the band, so I can't tell you what exactly, but he got beaten down, you know, really bad. And I don't know. I know that him and Pete were not paid nearly as much as the other two guys. You know, they, they made most of the money. Of course, 
you know, they were doing all the writing and that's the way they split things. But even, even on live shows, I know that they made more money than, than Richard and Pete did. And to me, you know, they're on that stage just the same amount of time as the other two guys, you know, it's like, I don't look at things that way, you know, I'm not going to be paid more when these other guys are on the stage with me doing the same thing. Yeah, well, that's that's very altruistic of you, but I think you, you know, to your point, you're just trying to create that spirit of brotherhood and that bond between band's members, and I think that's why we see. Uh, I, I sometimes think you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, though. So you, either either which way, there are, are an equal number of the yin and yang applies, the positive and the negative applies. It just, you know, to your point uh, earlier, mate, you've just got to do what you feel is right. And whatever sits well with you spiritually, right. but I can tell you, mate, turning yourself inside out like what Richard was doing isn't going to bloody help you. You know, um, no. When, when I spoke to David, he sort of alluded that that the, the drug use was a pattern of behaviour. But you got to think that the reason he probably dived into a lot of that stuff was because of the way that he was feeling internally, for the way that he managing his emotional state because he wasn't being valued potentially. That's certainly what sure. the conclusions that I'm drawing here based on the, com- the conversation I'm having with you now, comments that David said when I had a chat to him, um, and just some of the other things that I've read as well. Uh, it takes a very – I think, you know, the other bloke far more prominent that went through it was Jason Newstead. I, I couldn't believe the way that he was treated in Metallica. I mean, that's to be honest, I can't listen to Metallica to this day for that reason. It's the key reason, and, and, I, and I hope Robert is really looking after his own – Got, got his own back in that band because Robert's a tremendous musician and bass player, Robert Trevilio. But Jason was just treated like shit in that outfit and he was called gay and all sorts of things by the guy, by the guys. You know, of course he isn't, but it was done as a, as a way to sort of keep him in check because they, uh, I mean, who knows, I, uh, the, the legend of Cliff Burton is like the legend of Kurt Cobain and Randy Rhodes. I mean, we'll never really know what the real, the character really of the guy is because it's been turned into uh, something bigger than, it's a, it's a myth. It's a legend, you know. At this point in time, but poor old Jason, uh, I think, really copped it in that band. And, and I saw a recent photo of him. He doesn't look that great himself. You now it could just be age, but you got to think there's a lot of that stuff that he's kept internally, um, emotionally, yep. and he's in, he's internalized his emotions whilst he's dealing with all this shit. Just telling himself, "Well, I'm in the biggest heavy metal band of all time. Like it or lump it." But it doesn't work that way. You know, we're all people and, no. and you know, we, we've all got, you know, in your my case, mate, we've got kids and stuff, mate, and, and our, our emotional state really needs to be kept stable for them. So I've, I've left plenty of bands before in the past where I didn't, I thought there was a power imbalance or there's somebody that was just being a, a rude dick and just prioritised the music over um, congeniality between bands members and they're bloody awful to be in those situations I couldn't I mean at least at least in Jason's case he played on black <laughs> so at least he gets those royalty checks no matter how small they, a percentage he might have taken that's one of the highest selling albums of all time so he, he's uh, right. hopefully his bank balance is sort of looking a bit fatter because of that but otherwise mate who'd, who'd put themselves through it who'd do well, it unless he was paid you know to play on that album a certain amount of money which is also possible yeah, well, I, I hope he got publishing. That's all I can say with Jason Newstead's case. So I really do hope he got publishing. I thought he was his contribution was significantly undervalued in that band. And he, I, I saw him, at, I saw the band whenever they used to come to Australia through the nineties, and he performed really well. He was really one of the stars of the band on stage. Uh, you know, with I mean, James is so charismatic with what he does as well. But Kirk, I've never really felt offered too much. You know, he just sort of does the wah thing and has his curly hair flying to, in the fan that's blowing on him at the time. But um, Jason really worked the crowd. And um, and God knows as a bass player, I have a lot of imp- empathy for anybody who has to play along to Lars Ulrich who are just he, – he, so, <laughs> he, he made so many mistakes when they played in Brisbane. Even James turned around and said to him after one of the songs, he goes, well, at least the three of us managed to stop on time. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so. I've seen a few videos of like – of Lars mistakes just that's all the video is like 10 or 12 things that he did I mean I'm by no means a perfect drummer I make a lot of mistakes too but you know it's it's weird with me it's it's like when I start playing a song I click the sticks and and I don't know what's going to happen I really Mm. don't it's like something happens and it's not me anymore and it just kind of I let I let the song kind of take hold of me you know, and kind of like let it make me play. It's it's a very strange thing. Like in between songs, 
I, I don't, you, you can watch bands and you'll see they go on tour and they say the same things between every song. They say, you're the greatest audience, you know, you know, <laughs> to each, each audience, yeah. they, they tell them they're the greatest and this and that. I don't even know what I'm going to say in between songs half the time. I, when I get up there, it's just like, it's chaos. I, I it just like, I click the sticks and just go because if I, especially with the, the way we play these songs and playing drums and singing at the same time, if I stop to think I'm done, Yes, I don't have yeah. time. I have so many things going on mm -hmm. all at once. You know, I have five things going on, two legs, two arms and a mouth. I got five things going on at once. And I'm trying to listen to everything through this little speaker that usually sucks. And, and, and it sounds like crap. And, and, and it's like, I'm trying to, if I stop to think about any of that stuff, I'm done. Yeah. You know, yeah. things move so fast the way we do our songs and we usually do end up playing, you know, faster, even faster live, but it's the energy, you know, a lot of people, when they see us, they're like, wow, I felt something when you guys were playing. And to me, that is better. I would rather hear that than you played a perfect set and didn't make any mistakes. Yeah, I'm definitely with you on that one there. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just the, the consistency of the mistakes Lars makes that really, uh, really, uh, and, and the prominence of the band, given that they're playing to tens of thousands of people every night, make it stand out a lot more. So I know it sounds like a harsh criticism to have toward the fellow because uh, I think Metallica owe a lot of their success to him too and his business now and his ability to get things done. I have no question about that. Also, he, he could definitely arrange songs if the credits on the albums are to be uh, taken at face value. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've long since moved on from, from Metallica, I think, as a lot of extreme metal fans have, have done. And it's um, – I understand your point exactly about in your case mate you've got five things going on and mate if if it all comes down to the rehearsal and the preparation I imagine for you doesn't it really not leaving anything to chance because God knows how many times I've been on stage and not being able to hear anybody else around me except for myself just muscle memory relying right. on muscle memory and even looking over at the singer's mouth to see because I do a bit of singing too to see where they are in the song trying to make out where they are up to in the song if I can't hear anything else to work out where my part comes in. Um, you've got to yeah. – I don't think people who aren't musicians realise the amount of things that go wrong when we're on stage as well. Something's working a minute ago and it no longer works now. You've just got to keep trucking. You can't stop the song. No, no. You, you know, I've train wrecked a couple of times, you know, and, and it, it happens. But uh, yeah. with Metallica, their songs are very simple – and he, he only plays drums. He doesn't, and he has the best equipment in the world to hear through, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would be so, if I had that kind of money and equipment behind me, I, I sure. I mean, when we practice, we, we do pretty well, but then, you know, like I said, when we get on stage, it's, it's all, it just goes like chaos. It just seems like a whole different thing. And it, and it's so much, it seems it's always seems to me is very hard to hear on stage for me. And I, I probably should go into an in ear monitoring system for something like that, because we can practice, you know, a million times and get everything right. But when you get on that stage and everything sounds completely different and you're on a different drum set than you're normally used to, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a, I have a specific kind of drum set that I put together cause I liked it. And I have a lot of drums, you know, a lot of toms, I should say, and when we play live, I never get to use my drum set hardly ever because we're always flying places and playing these places. And, 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 and you know, the drums are never what I have mm -hmm. at my house, you know, when we practice all the time. So when I get on a stage half the time, I don't know what I'm going to be playing on until I take a look at it 15 minutes before we play. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do, you, do you bring a drum tech with you when, when you travel or is it, do you do everything yourself? Never have, have never been able to do that. Mm. Yeah, we gotcha. travel just the five of us. And we don't have any techs. We have no sound man. We we're, we're we're totally out there raw. When I play, I bring when I when I go places, I bring my sticks, my cymbals, my pedals, and um, my headset mic, and that's it. That's right, because that's what Everything he sings else, for, isn't it? it, it you're, you're one of the few drummers that uses the, um, well, few, there's very few singing drummers, as we know, but 
especially in extreme metal, but I like the way you use the the -the over-the-top microphone, the headset mic that you've got there because I think it allows you to focus on the drumming. It certainly looks to me like as though you can focus on the drumming a bit more. Yeah, you definitely can because I I remember on the Grind Crusher tour, I had a microphone that needed a a, uh, phantom power. And, And one of the places we played did not have phantom power. So they set up a microphone in a stand for me and I mm. tried that. It was terrible. I, you know, trying to reach that microphone and they had it on this big boom stand and they literally had a guy like pushing it over to me every time I'd look at him, like when I'm about to sing and he didn't know our songs, you know, and he would literally yeah. like swing the mic around for me to start singing, you know, and then he'd pull it back away. Cause they didn't have like the right kind of boom like one of those weird ones that you'll see some drummers use. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And one time, like, he pushed the mic up and it hit me in the tooth, and I'm, like, you know, trying to play, and it's just, it was crazy, you know? I'm like, this is crazy. So after that, I got a better headset mic that didn't need a phantom power. <laughs> but well, you got to learn how to do these uh, things. Yeah, I know. Look, I think I, I've tried to plan for every – I play up until recently. I used to play every weekend, and uh, I tried to plan for every single thing that could go wrong: two guitars, two basses, two amps, two sides of the PA, uh, basically mixed separately, even sometimes, just so as though if one crashes. I mean, digital desk it doesn't really happen, but the old analog equipment it used to all the time. Um, and sometimes, especially in playing, so we're playing just covers, by the way. So I'm not playing originals music, but the venue relies on you to keep on playing. So you're often playing um, four one-hour sets. So you start at 10 and you're off stage at 3, 3 a.m., this sort of thing. You know, the old, uh, I, I just call it the um, the treadmill, the old cover band treadmill sort of thing. And in that <laughs> the environment, bar band set. the bar band set, yeah, and you really do. You, you have to consider every single thing that could go wrong, and, and I'll get this wrong because I know I've said it on the podcast before, but between my bass, this is just my bass, right, and going out the PA, I worked out there was something in the vicinity of 35 points of failure. Now, you don't want to think about that too much because otherwise you're planning for things that probably as a, as a probability won't go wrong. But then when things do go wrong, you start thinking, oh, shit, where do I start? Where do I start with this? And it's, it's not usually – with guitars, I find it's not usually too much. The problem with the basses is being active basses, the battery case. So the battery might work, but the battery case fails. So it stops connecting, and that can happen mid-song. I mean, I've, I've had it all happen. I've stuck all sorts of things, lead pencils and all sorts of things in there to try to get it to, try to, get it to work and just sort of compress it up against the back of the battery case so as the battery connects uh, where it needs to, to to deliver power. But you, you stop enjoying yourself, don't you? You sort of – it depends where that happens in the set. If it sort of happens halfway through the final set, you don't really care that much because you're almost done. But if it happens halfway through the first set and you've got another three and a half to go – you're like, oh, oh shit, yeah. oh my god! Well, and, I've never uh, done you know multiple sets in a night because I've I've never really done a bar band kind of thing myself. You know, I've always just done a show, basically. Yeah. You know, where I get out there and just go crazy for an hour. <laughs> so that's kind of like, but you know, like say sound check. You know, you you'll never have the same sound that you had at sound check. Yeah, it doesn't course, matter. Yeah. You can sound check all afternoon, but once people get in that building and three or four other bands have played before you, everything is going to sound different than it did that afternoon. Mm-hmm. Indeed it does. And that's, you know what I put that down to? Cause I've done plenty of sound checks myself, just having people in the room and having them absorb the mute, the sound, the, the ambience is entirely different to when you were sound checking and nobody was in there. It sounds obvious, but the difference between the two is huge. So I look honestly yeah. these days. I just I I, I, I literally just gave my pre sixteen four two desk to my daughter's school because they didn't have one, and I've stopped doing a lot of the my own band stuff because it's just too stressful, and I just couldn't be fucking bothered to be honest with you. Uh, I'd rather just play in other people's bands and turn up and have my Jack Daniels and beer and go home. Um, <laughs> but yeah, look, I just had presets organized for everything, and you know what? If the sound wasn't perfect. What are you going to do? Nobody's paying to see us. They're just we're just a soundtrack to people's drinking and enjoying their weekend and dancing and shit like that. You know, it's a bit different to sort of someone turning up to an Eternus AD show or even a Metallica show. You know, where there's an expectation that things potentially are going to sound as they did on the recording. Not going to happen, right? Right, for sure. <laughs> 
Although I think some yeah, people I still mean, do, but you know. Yeah, that, and like I said before, that's the whole thing with death metal. People really want to see exactly what they hear on the record. Yes, it, that's. Uh, uh, I, don't, I never understood that about the way fans. I mean, just well, stay at home and listen to the record. Then I'm a bit with you. Exactly what you said earlier in the conversation about wanting to open up the songs a little bit and reinterpret some of the stuff that you've already been playing for some time. I think that gives fans a more unique experience. But God knows. Um, I'll never forget uh, another quick story about Lindsay, um, what's his name, Um, Buckingham from Fleetwood Mac. Watched him here in Brisbane at the Entertainment Centre and uh, probably about 20 seconds into Tusk, he puts his hands up and waves at the other musician. He goes, no, we stuffed it up, got to start over again. Let's do this, let's go, come on. And I thought even at that level, Fleetwood Mac, God knows how many times they've played Tusk and how many times they've toured the world. And Lindsay's just a tremendous musician and singer. Um, But you don't always get it right. You know, and you've just got to keep trucking and you've just got to keep doing your thing. And uh, sometimes things are so bad, though, like what Lindsay experienced, and you've got to start all over again and you've just got to do it. And I actually thought it was a really um, a really special moment to actually experience because I'd never seen that happen before from such a big band. Yeah, yeah it's happened to me a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you like. I mean, it happened to me when we played uh, our first really big show outside at Maryland Death Fest. It happened. We we had practiced the set; it was perfect. Everything went really well. So we went out there and we played. And and because we played a little bit faster, we got the set over with. And you know, we told Maryland Death Fest oh, we're going to play the key in entirety. Mm-hmm. So we did. And. We finished the set and okay, we're done. And then all of a sudden the sound man looks at us and goes, you still got five minutes. You want to play another song? (laughs) And we literally (laughs) had sat down, just honed the set, you know, to make it sound good for Maryland death fest. So I'm like, well, what do we do? (laughs) We hadn't planned on playing another song, you know, because when you're in a festival situation, you kind of don't think you're going to do an extra song. If anything, you might get one song or two songs cut. Cut off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so here we are. You know, the guys tell you, you got five minutes. What do you want to do? I said, well, well, let's just do Chapel of Ghouls. Well, we haven't played that song in two months, you know. So we start playing it. And then um, and it's outside. Of course, this is when they had the outside stages and it was really, really windy. Mm-hmm. And when you're playing outside on a really big stage and when you have a big burst of wind, it takes your 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 monitor and it just blows the sound away yeah. completely. You're not hearing it. So what happened was we, we get to that one really fast part in the song and it goes a bunch of times with a lead. So this photographer came running out right when that happened from the side. Mm-hmm. And I saw him come running up to the drum set. So here I am making faces and stuff for the guitar player. I mean, for the the photographer. And I totally didn't know where I was at that point. I'm like, (laughs) oh, shoot. You know, and and so I I stopped and they kept going. (laughs) And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. And it just, like I said, I was in the moment and it blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God. And I could not remember. I, I, I mean when I stopped and they kept playing and then they just kind of stopped and turned around, I didn't know where to go from there. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? You know, and we literally, and I was just like, uh Oh, <laughs> and, and it was, you know, but it was, it was kind of my fault because like I said, that, that photographer came running out and you can even see it on the video. He mm-hmm. comes running out, starts taking pictures. I mean, here I am making faces at him, totally paying attention to him and not the song. And, and, I'm all of a sudden I'm like, where are we at? <laughs> Cause this really long lead part was going. And that's all I was like, I didn't know if we had, I think it's a, a 12 measures. And I think I had done like seven or eight and I was, wasn't counting. Mm-hmm. So I was like, am I on eight or nine or am I on 10? Where am I at? And you know, and I thought we were at the last one and I stopped and they didn't. <laughs> and I was just like, uh Oh, <laughs> and then they kind of just stopped and turned around and then, they were like wanting me to pick the song back up, kind of like give me that look like let's start from there. And that really <laughs> slow part, that nah, 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 you know. And yeah. I'm like, I could not think of what was next. I my my mind just went blank. And all yeah, I, I, I was that, just yeah. like, uh, and I have like five thousand people staring at us like, um, what, what are you are doing? We, you know, they're all <laughs> looking at me like, 
what are you doing? <laughs> you know, we're ready to thrash. And I'm like, uh, we're going to start this one over. <laughs> That's all I could think. And so we played it a second time, but I mean, it was, you know, the, uh, uh, everything, the whole set went great with the key. Mm-hmm. And then that, that guy was like, Oh, you got five extra minutes. And it's like, okay, we'll just play this song then. You know, we haven't played it in two months, but it's okay. And you know, then I started like hamming it up for the camera guy and, and bam, it was totally my fault, but Oh my God, how embarrassing. It was the, one of the, probably the yeah. most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me on stage. <laughs> yeah, I I just, can, I, yeah, I can tell I you the other it. thing. Yeah, but I, I can understand that because you've already explained that you're in the zone and you're in the moment when you're playing and you've got five things going on. And as soon as something comes and takes you out of that zone, you're, it's very hard to get back in. It's like a vortex, isn't it? You know, and, and yeah. I, I, well, I, it, I can't it is, tell you. Definitely. I can't tell you how many times I've been on stage and done these filling gigs that, that come up quite often and uh, the singer will go, all right, we're going to play this song here and I go, I don't know it and it's by a band I've never heard of. Like it's in the charts at the moment. So I don't know, it's one of these Imagine Dragon songs or what have you and it'll be by a band I've never heard of playing a song I've never heard of and yet the singer playing the guitar because often a lot of these bar bands are just trios because you get paid more, you know, less people means you get you can split the thousand dollars between three people as opposed to four people and he'll go it's all right it's easy it's just and he'll be like mouthing in between the lyrics what the next riff is like the the chords and the next riff and i'm like i have no idea and i play five string bass so i'm just sort of going between the b and the e string and just turning myself down a little bit and just hoping the song finishes <laughs> sooner rather than later but i can't tell you how many times that's happened and i've learned that punters because of what I'm doing. It's very different to what you're doing. They're not as engaged in what I'm doing specifically or what we're doing specifically as a band. But as long as you look like you know what you're doing, people generally don't give a shit. If it's just a song here or there, it doesn't even appear as a blip on the radar. As I say, I, I, yeah. have, you, have you had that happen before, when, when you, especially when you were starting out with Trey, where he just started playing a riff and just went off into, I don't know, a Judas Priest song or something like that, and you're like, oh, I don't know this song, but I'll go along with it just for the sake of it and we'll see where we end up <laughs> yeah, well you know like I said we, I, I don't I've never really played in a cover band so I, I haven't experienced that type of situation you know but mm. that's what yeah, a couple times I've gotten lost you know in my own songs <laughs> <laughs> but basically most of the time it's just because I start drifting off and thinking about other things you know or something yeah. distract yeah. me and and I I I don't. That's one thing that I'm not used to having a drum roadie around or people around me when I play, mm-hmm. and so I kind of don't like it. I, I I don't like people behind me when I play. I don't like people around filming and stuff like that. It's not really. I, I kind of like 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 you know I said before you you know yeah, you said nice. too yeah. you know you get in that zone, and it's it's a different world that you're in really. Mm. And yeah, to is, have yeah. other people distracting you from that, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll look at the audience and, and, but then I'll, that will be done on purpose. But when somebody comes walking up while I'm playing and wants my attention, that throws me off. Yeah. You know? Well, so, I understand. Yeah. No, I definitely understand. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the way you've explained it. Yeah. G'day everybody. Just a brief interruption it was at this point i had to go and tend to my kids who were going a bit stir crazy because we were in the middle of lockdowns just keep in mind this chat occurred in april of 2020 look when the chat comes back in it is dominated by topics to do with covid and the lockdowns but there's plenty of music discussion still to come i've got two daughters age five and six so they uh Oh, the, the, the house looks like it's been turned inside out at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, t- I tell you, I don't know. How long have you guys been in your lockdown situation? Uh, really only the last, since Monday, I think, you know, like where we're talking, like no, basically no interacting with anybody outside of immediate family is basically been the order. In you know, a bit more detail to it, oh, but wow. that's basically it, yeah. How long? Two, two um, weeks mon- or so? No, just since Monday, so four days, three days. Oh, um, oh wow. We, it's been, like, I understand, like, the problem is, like, in big cities like Sydney and Melbourne, people are panicking, so they're doing that bloody panic buy thing. And I think they don't want to risk, like, chaos, you know, idiots 
fighting each other, which has already been plenty of images of that anyway. A lot of that comes from Western Sydney, you know, those fucking awful images, um, those idiot women fighting each other and stuff, you know, over toilet paper. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, so I, I think they just sort of looked at that and the, Sydney and Melbourne both have about 5 million people in them these days. So if things go wrong, they're going to go wrong down there. Uh, around us, mate, it's, it's no dramas. People are a bit more self-sufficient, a bit, bit more. Uh, right, yeah. Where, where I am is being surprised. Com- yeah, it's been I mean, it's been hard to get stuff like toilet paper here, but but uh, people have actually been pretty calm overall in Tampa, in this area, you know? Mm. Yeah, around me they have been too. Uh, we've had the usual toilet paper shortages and beef and mints left the uh, ground beef, I think you call it over there, left the supermarket shelves about two weeks ago, but it's slowly starting to come back now. Well, I think it's just a new normal, and I think we're going to be in it for another couple of months potentially. Um, yeah, I, I probably so. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's going to stop, mate, anytime soon. You know, not with, not whilst they've still got the borders open. Um, there's just going to be new cases coming in all the time into Australia and the US. I, I just can't yeah, understand why yeah. they don't lock down the bloody borders. I mean, just for now, just do it and just contain it and just let in nationals, so American citizens into the states and Australian citizens in, into Australia. Um, right. For everybody else, just stay fucking at home. Excuse my language. Just don't go out. You know, and there's been yeah. That seems to be the only way to stop it at this point. Well, the images that I'm seeing coming out of countries like Ecuador aren't aren't good at all. I'm talking people dead in the middle of the street and just having uh, blue tarpaulin put over the top of them until the coroner or, or whoever the morgue comes and picks them yeah. up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's it's not good, man. But I think people have just got to bloody understand, okay, that this is deadly serious. I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there that are banging on about it being a cover up for the rollout of 5G and all this stuff. And I just think, I don't know, it's a hell of a way to get 5G rolled out. <laughs> if that's the yeah, way you want to look at it, exactly. <laughs> I, I, and I don't believe that either. I mean, I don't believe the 5G thing. That's for sure. But I do believe that it was created in a laboratory and let loose. It looks oh, it looks increasingly <laughs> like that. I I tend to agree with that. Yeah. Well, I think that the Chinese. I don't think it came from somebody eating a bat and uh, and that was it. You know, they were talking about like, oh, patient zero ate this bat. You know, that mm. that I just don't believe that. You know, came from everything that's happening now came from that. Yeah. Well, a lot of there's there's a lot of credible news sources that have pivoted and are talking exactly what you're saying now that there's there's a laboratory there in Wuhan. And the, um, the the particular, I can't remember the name of the bat, but he's not local to that area, that they're laying responsibility on humans eating this particular type of bat. It's not in Wuhan, apparently. And they're very geograph- geographically sensitive to things in China, apparently. So they eat what's around them and not a lot of other stuff comes in. It's like a protectionist form of industry, even that's, though it's in those very disgusting looking markets. But yeah, I, I think it might have been created in a in a laboratory at the very least and being unleashed but it's just a it's just a chemical weapon then really isn't it that's what it is yes for sure i think so you know but either way mate i think we're stuck there's been so many are there a lot of your mates you know from from big bands that are that you've spoken to that have really been affected by it i.e they've had tours booked this sort of thing and they've had to cancel and they've lost a bunch of dough because of that oh yeah for sure Every tour has been canceled. Everything in the United States, show-wise, the bars, even the bars are closed now. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. yeah we I mean, don't it's even the have same. regular, not, even the regular bars that don't even have bands are closed now. Yeah, nothing's doing, is it? The whole thing's just ground to a halt, and it's, it's up to people to stay inside and not interact, I think. That's how quickly we'll get over this. But if they... If they and the thing is, like, I, I'm not into sports, but sports have come to a halt completely you know how people are with football and you know and so hockey and and, and mm, you know, like, baseball yeah, yeah. here in, in, in the u.s it's huge you know especially football it's it's huge and it has just come to a grinding halt they're not having any more hockey games they're not having any well it's not football season anymore but it, it's you know it's looking like if it, it pushes too much farther there won't be any football season either but, you know, the baseball, hockey, all that's come to a – basketball, it's all come to a complete stop. And, you know, they're starting to – even they were going to have games without people there and just televise it. Mm-hmm. And then the players started getting it. <laughs> so now they can't even do that. 
You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah, they they sport is a, is a billion dollar industry in the United States. It's it's huge. You know, mm. that most people that's what they do on their on on their spare time is sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not not that they all play it, but they go see games. It's it's one of the biggest things in the United States to do is go see a, a basketball game or a football game or you know a, a hockey game. It, it, that's what people do here. Mm. That's their biggest that, that's their biggest pastime, and it is gone. I mean, the stadiums are empty. Nothing is going on anywhere. Mm. No games, nothing. All the way down to like the little high school teams and junior high playing, you know, baseball and football. Nothing. Nobody. Yeah, it's the same here, mate. Yeah, the the rugby league combat, the NRL, the National Rugby League competition was playing in front of literally nobody in empty stadiums for one one round just to try to keep it going. And I, and I think a lot of people in North America started watching it. That and I think AFL, our Australian rules football, started doing the same thing. Um, but it wasn't going to last too long. The problem for us is we don't have the, the massive economies of scale that the U.S. does. And I don't know whether our professional leagues are going to withstand it intact, meaning that if we do come out the other side of this and they can't play all for season 2020, I don't know if some clubs are going to survive because they need the, no, the, I mean, the revenue from from audience attendance or match attendance. Oh, yeah. These guys make millions a year. Yeah, mm-hmm. one person can make twenty million a year now. One player. So you mm-hmm. imagine you have a whole team of players that are making anywhere from two to twenty million a season. How are they going to pay that with, mm-hmm. with no audience? Well, I know over here what they're doing is they've told them we're only going to pay you eighty. Uh, we're going to pay you fifteen percent of what you were getting paid before, because the clubs are going broke. Wow. Um, and the game yeah. is more important than any individual player. So you can't just play – forget, contracts need to be ripped up at this point in time. They're not worth the paper that they're bloody – you know, that the, the printer has printed them out on. Um, they don't make a difference right. these days because this is a very – this is a, a unprecedented is that word that keeps on coming up, but it truly is. You know, there are whole segments yeah. of the economy – our economy is very similar to yours um, – that won't recover, I don't think. You know, and, and that's scary because we've only been locked down for a couple of weeks and with how long this thing is potentially going to go on for, um, the, the, big issue elsewhere, the big issue I think for both the United States and Australia is to get manufacturing back up and running again in both countries. It was a well, that, bad idea. Same here. I mean, we relied every literally everything you bought was made in China. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Over here, everything you looked at, everything you bought is made in China. So yeah. I don't know, you know, and it kind of, in a way, maybe this is what needed to happen to, to like you said, start manufacturing our own stuff again. Yeah, it's 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 a hell of a corrective, um, it, it, like it's a correction, really, isn't it? That's happening at the moment. We've had, I think, in Australia, we've had something like almost thirty years of, even with a GFC happening, almost thirty years of economic growth overall. Um, that's measured by GDP, and I could be wrong there, but it's it's about thirty years anyway. So that's a that's unprecedented in history. Again, that word there again, unprecedented. But you have to have little spikes and valleys, otherwise it's not it's not it's not real. And I think if we saw anything through the GFC, it's that the, if the bankers and and people who control the money for the sake of controlling money, i.e., they don't have a product outside of just handling cash, are uh, have the if they're being bailed out for starters, which is of course what happened after the G- GFC. But if they've got too much of a hand in the way economies uh, keep on running, so say for example, it's cheaper to there's that idea that in the short term and mid term it's cheaper to have China producing everything, but it actually affects us in the long term. Like right now, not having manufacturing on shore. So whilst you might have made a lot of money through higher margins in the short term with manufacturing being sent offshore, it doesn't help the national identity. And indeed, moving into this phase that we're about to move into now, where um, you know face masks, you got like I know in the states you got New Balance and Nike making face masks these days. I think it is. Um, businesses right. are having to pivot and they're having to do things that they've never done before. You know, it's a bit of a community effort, but in the longer term, mate, I think you've got to have basic manufacturing in each country. You can't just rely on shipping bloody lanes to be delivering everything. It's not, 
it's not the way to preserve an economy. No, it really isn't. And and even like like uh, locally, we had the last couple of years craft beers got huge. So we yeah. had several in Tampa. We had several um, companies open up, new companies open up to do their own beers, and they had these big breweries. You know what they're making now? Hand that's sanitizer. Right. Yes, that's right. They're doing that here as well. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen I that. mean, yeah. there's uh, two big breweries in Tampa that did their own craft beer, and, and now they're not. They're making hand sanitizer with their beer. Mm. <laughs> it's like wow, but they did. They did it. They turned it around, you know. And they're actually producing like four thousand gallons a day of of hand sanitizer mm-hmm. instead of beer. Yeah, Bundaberg. In the rum same in the, rum in the same equipment, but using the same equipment that they did to make the beer. Well, it's, it's good that there's a bit of innovation going on and there needs to be, I mean, let's face it, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So I'm glad that that is happening. But why don't, we, why don't they just keep it going afterwards? You know, why do we, right. for example, why the hell do we need to get something as important, and it really is important as hand sanitizer, made in China and imported? There's no reason for that. And I'm not, I don't even think, I think what it comes down to, a lot, a lot of it comes, people think that I'm talking about protectionism and um, fencing off uh, individual economies. I'm not doing, I'm not saying that at all. I think the most important thing you can do is educate the public about what happens if they keep on buying shit that's made overseas, what it does to economies. You know, go, go back to, yeah. I mean, and, and people focus on things that, that are, that are just silly, like the car industry, for example. I don't give a shit if we're driving Japanese, Korean, or even cars made in China, that's fair enough if that's got to go over there to do that because those are big ticket items that cost a lot to produce and you need to find a cheap labor force to do that. I totally understand that. But how is that the case with hand sanitizer and face masks and tissues? You know, even tea, right. cups of tea, mate. you know, Twining's tea. I don't know whether you've got Twining's tea in the States there, but tea is made in China these days. I'm talking like tea bag yeah. tea. And that never, I, I, I could, could tell you, mate, just about every tea bag and I'm a prolific drinker of tea peppermint tea in particular um, there's only a few companies that make it in Australia now and they've got very small boxes that of course dollar for dollar on the uh, on, on the tea bag itself are, are probably double or triple what Twinings are, are asking people to pay for because it's made in China but I, I'm not going to do it mate. Right. I'm going to focus I know I'm going to it's going to hit my hip pocket a bit more but I'm going to support local industry from now on I'm going to do everything I can to do that and I did try to do it before but was pretty lazy about it, to be honest with you, but I'm not going to be that way again. I'm not going to be complacent about it ever again. Well, plus, like you said, most people didn't realize the impact that it was causing by not doing it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, The Chinese thing is very concerning, especially for us here in Australia. I mean, it's a big issue for you guys, too, um, from a military standpoint, but they're really right on our doorstep here. They're not very far away from us at all. And uh, what they're doing well, in the guys, South... Yeah. Yeah, South China Sea. And, mate, there's, there's something like um, – it's very hard to get credible data on this, but I would say my opinion is there's – and it's certainly I think the data supports this to an extent – there's at least a million born Chinese people in Australia at the moment. So we're only a country of 24 million yeah. people. It's a lot. I noticed that when I was over there. There actually were. And I, I didn't – now that you said it, I didn't realize how close they really were to you guys, um, you know, the distance-wise. But I did realize how many there were over there. Well, I think we must be educating half of the Chinese communist government's children. And and because oh, I'm back at uni these days, and I'm at a uni that basically is modeled on the American system. It's Bond University. So we have a lot of students, particularly from Florida, your part of the world there, come on over. Um, but we also get a lot of Chinese students as well. And, and, and what I'm saying is not racially motivated whatsoever. I want to be clear about this. We're talking no, about... Facts. Yeah, facts and sovereign identity and, and borders. And, I mean, I, they, they, the Chinese love Australia, we know that, and, and almost to an individual, everyone that I've dealt with personally has been fantastic. You know, I've dealt with even some recently for some assessments that we've got, um, and uh, great great kids, you know, switched on, all the rest of it, but I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about the government and the decisions that that bloody government makes, and it's, it's, it's just, it seems to have bought into this whole idea that you know, imperial power is the way to go and they're not doing that by warfare anymore they're doing that by taking oceans like what they're doing in the south china sea or really what what its real name is is the philippine sea um by right. putting man-made um man-made lands on there and saying that's chinese land 
you know, I, I don't know whether you remember this, but a couple of years ago, it would have been unfathomable for the Vietnamese government to reach out to the United States for anything. But they did. They reached out and they said, can you please help us stop China doing what they're doing here to the US government? Can you think of that? Can you think of that happening if you, you go back even five years ago? You know, no, this is the not Vietnamese really. government, a communist government, you know, reaching out to a capitalist superpower for help against a communist superpower. Um, and this is the fun, this is the world's upside down these days. It's very, very crazy. I and mean, it was crazy before this bloody COVID-19 thing took off. But yeah, I, I think, and there's a real big issue in Australia too with the amount of foreign uh, Chinese ownership of Australian land, farming land, and what they're going to do with it. Mm. Because water is such a precious, well, precious resource here. What always got me very confused was how much money we supposedly have borrowed and owe to China. Yeah, I don't Our understand debt. that either. That why, what are the, or is it because the Chinese government has bought a raft of or wanted to be paid for whatever it is, um, to your point there, in U.S. government bonds? So yeah, I don't understand this stuff, I'm, but I read about it. I, yeah, I mean, when you look at how much we owe them in debt, it's like, how did that happen? You know, I don't, I don't understand how that even happens because, I mean, with the amount of trade we do with them and the amount of things we buy, you'd think it would be the other way around. I think, I think to Donald Trump's point, um, the Chinese are extremely shrewd business people and they've been basically ripping off the American consumer and trade partners for a long time. They've been doing it here too. They've been doing it here too. They, the Chinese are a bit like you know, Indians in that they hedge their bets. They never lose. And we could learn a lot from that, sure, but there's no such thing as win-win. There's all there's win-lose. We know that the bullshit corporate speak of win-win doesn't exist. You know, there's a partner. When you like, just say you and I, you know, we, we sell a used car. Either we get a good deal by selling a used car for more than what it's worth, or we get a bad deal because we sell it well under market price because we just want to get the thing off our front yard. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, there is motivation behind doing everything. Yeah, you yeah. can't have two somebody winners. Somebody always yeah. has to win and somebody always has to lose. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> in that, every that's situation. When, yeah, and that's – and you, look, you've experienced that with the bands too, but on a on a economic basis, if we're talking about the, the countries and the way – the way, um, especially the way globalism uh, has affected trade um, – and this whole idea that national identity uh, has nothing to do with trade, that's bullshit. You know, that's why the British people got out of the EU. They were, they were fed up with having their identity eroded, and that's actually what it was about, and being told what to do, say, and think by a effectively a foreign government sitting there in, is it Brussels or The Hague, the EU convenes? Um, the British people were just fed up with that. Well, overwhelmingly, they were, of course. You wouldn't believe that if you're on Twitter and listen to all of the idiots jump up and down about anti-Brexit and all this sort of stuff. But I keep on reminding myself that a lot of these people are underneath the age of 25 yet, and they haven't lost a parent yet. They haven't held a job for a long enough period of time to sort of learn how to compromise, and they certainly haven't got kids in most cases. No. Nope. So yeah, they're all the younger ones. Yeah, the younger ones. So, I mean, I'm not going to bloody listen to any of them. They might have some ideas occasionally, but for every 10 things they say, the you know, every three of their ideas are going to be completely stupid. Um, and they're certainly bearing fruit on social media. That's why I don't comment much on social media, mate. I don't comment really at all. I just comment on some music stuff and some football stuff, some rugby stuff. But outside of that, I, I couldn't be bothered commenting on anything else because I'm not going to argue with nameless, faithless idiots. Um, oh, I don't ever post anything political anymore. I, I did it a few times back in the election, you know, just – and, man, it, it, anytime you post something political now, you're going to lose friends and you're going to gain friends from it. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's it's really interesting, though. I've got to tell you, the amount of musicians that I've spoken to that have said, stop, stop recording or don't include this in, when I release it as a podcast, but, man, I, I can tell you – certainly the overwhelming majority that have offered me opinion from your part of the world totally support Donald Trump. And you, and that's that's a very broad cross-section of people that I've interviewed. Heavy metal, punk, indie rock, pop, some jazz and blues guys. And if, if an opinion's offered, I can tell you 90% of the time, it's going to be in support of Donald Trump. It's really interesting to see that. And I think that that hints at the broader... Um, populations uh, like the, their voting intentions and preferences too. So whilst you go into social media and all you're, all you're really reading is 
Donald Trump's this, he's that, he's an orange man bad, all of this sort of stuff. Really, the undercurrent is is actual. Really, in the in the, the electorate, is support for him, and I think that's the same here with our leader here too. Is very different to Donald Trump, but as a centre right leader. Mm. You know, so um, the moral is social media ain't real life. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. right on that. Well, I mean, mine mine is. I mean, the, I have to say, the stuff that I post is pretty much me. You know, yeah. But then, like I said, I won't. I I don't post any political stuff anymore at all. I mean, I used to post some jokes here and there about, you know, like you know this person or that person, but I don't even do that anymore. I stay completely away from it. Mm. Yeah, I, I I look. I I have an opinion, but because I'm virtually a nobody, nobody gives a shit. Whereas if you say something, you can have half a dozen people jumping on your back saying, "What do you believe this? What do you do?" You know, you're 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 a prominent musician at the end of the day. Uh, and, and I feel for you guys in that position because, yeah, you're still human and you've still got to lead the life that the rest of us have and you've still only got one vote. But if you do go off and you have an opinion, um, then you, you it basically painted into a corner or, or one of these sites like Blabbermouth or Ultimate Guitar will pick it up and use that as the basis for some clickbait. And I think Blabbermouth has been overwhelming. They're very supportive of a lot of the work that I've done over the years, I've got to say, but I always feel for the artist. I had a chat to Mark from Suicide Silence, tremendous individual, good bloke, but he's definitely anti-Donald Trump, and he got picked up, and uh, the amount of comments that were real, I won't even repeat what, what, you know, you can imagine what the comments were toward him. On oh, I'm there. sure, yeah. The poor bastard, but uh, the same thing happened to poor old Carl Willits a couple of years ago, when he, when he said some stuff about Donald Trump, I uh, got on there, and a lot of people, so it's on both sides of politics, I understand that, but you get these nameless, faceless pseudonym warriors, as I call them, on social media, sprouting off opinions and hammering artists for having an opinion, even though their opinion is not fully, even their, their own opinion could never be fully informed because they spend all of their time yelling and shouting at people via their via their iPhone or Android device on, on social media, instead of actually getting educated and finding the, nu- the nuances or the, um, the devil that is in the detail, so to speak. You know, right, right. So no, you're right, completely right. Yeah, but mate, look, it's it's been a good chat. I really enjoyed this. So I mean, I know it took us a while to to connect, but I, I just want to tell you, man, you know, none of this stuff from my perspective ever gets taken for granted. I know you're a busy bloke, and I just want to thank you for making the music that you have over the years because it's been a very special accompaniment to to parts of my life. There's been whole swathes of my life where I can remember listening to Demon Seed or something like that, Chapel of Ghouls or any of the stuff off the key and in particular recently with Paradox I put the Paradox on, the cassette on uh, for my kids actually uh, whilst they're drawing so they're five and six year old girls sitting down and they're drawing and the music playing in the background is Paradox so there you go so you have have had a very special place in my life over the years mate and I just want you to keep on doing what you're doing that's awesome. And, and, you know, the good thing is we've been um, the last, like I said, we hadn't practiced the last two weekends because of all, all the chaos going on here. But um, the last, uh, well, like January and February, we're already uh, on our fourth new song. So I haven't um, worked on any lyrics yet because we haven't put all the placement of where the leads and stuff are going to go. But with our songs, I always end up, we always end up writing the music first. And I, then I let them put the leads where we think they would be best. And then I always do the lyrics last okay. because I kind of like what I kind of, I have, uh, the good thing is I have a list of probably close to 20 song titles in my phone. And with each song title, when I come up with a song title, I are like the whole story almost is in my brain Mm -hmm. already. You know, I just have to kind of piece it together. So I have like 20 song titles in my phone in my notes and and so what I do is when we finish a song music wise you know then we place the leads where they're going to go then I sit down and listen to it and as a whole pretty we make a little quick recording of it and and I and I get the feeling of the song mm-hmm. and then I look at my song titles and go which one is going to fit this and it it just kind of comes to me and then uh, and then I pick out you know, the places where I know I can easily sing and, and play drums 
you know, there's a couple of rhythms. I'm like, I'm not going to sing over that rhythm, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. So that's kind of like the way we've, uh, it's, it's always worked for us. And, and with paradox, which is something, uh, we did something that we never like with all the after death stuff, basically yeah. Damien, our one guitar player wrote all the riffs just about, you know, mm-hmm. our other guitar player used to write a couple of riffs here and there and throw them in. But this time when we went to write songs for, for, for uh, paradox, I got in the room with just me and the two guitar players, and I, I ladder, literally sat there behind my drums. And one's on one side of me, the other's on the other. All right, you play one riff. Let's mm-hmm. learn it. We learn it. And now look at the other guitar player. Okay, you play a riff now, and we'll learn it, and we'll piece these two together. And then I'll look back at the other guitar player. And these songs in paradox were literally written almost fifty-fifty that way back and forth and back and forth and we forced things to go together almost. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what happened. And we're doing it again with, with the new songs and we're already working on our fourth new song. And considering uh, paradox only had nine songs, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> so we're getting close to almost half the album new next album written. Hmm. That's awesome. So we're already yeah. working on song number four. So we'll probably do another nine, 10 songs on the next one too, because maybe even, I don't want to do eight. Eight seems like a little, not enough. Oh, it depends. But I don't want to do more. Yeah. Than- I, I understand your point. Yeah. But I think there's so much quality in the music that you write that I think, but to be honest with you, I think fans would be thrilled just with an EP. So it's even three or four songs, that sort of thing. Um, well, I, I understand I nine songs and it's almost an hour long. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and and some of the new songs are already like six and eight minutes long. So, uh, it, and it just it doesn't seem that way when you're playing them. Sometimes it just seems like they go by like a four minute song. Yeah. But then you look at the time and it's like six and a half, seven minutes. And then sometimes you go, "Damn, this song's already six minutes, and we haven't even came up with a keyboard intro for it yet." <laughs> Which is going to add another minute onto it. So, you know, we're going to have another long album, that's for sure. And it's still not going to be it's going to be like probably another nine songs more than likely. And, and, uh, but it'll still be right around an hour long. So Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, I don't want to write a 25 minute album. Yeah, for sure. No, no, I don't want to write an hour hour and a half album either, you know, and bore the hell out of people. Well, I think (laughs) you've, you've never done, you've, you've done things very tastefully. I think, you know, with your intros, if some of them have been a bit longer, they've always been very interesting. Some bands, when they do intros that last a minute or two, you know, they think that they're, they're, they're mimicking the beginning to Holy Diver or something. And they think, that, you know, that, that was a one-time deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, nobody else really gets to do that. Okay, that was done then. Right. And it's associated with Dio and that, that track. You know, the, these bands that have these, as I say, I get sent almost up to, I think this week, mate, I might have been sent 30 or 40 already. This is how much music is being sent out just due to people trying to get things into the market and into the people's earlobes whilst they're self-quarantining and all the rest of it. But some of some of the introductions will, will go on for five and six minutes. And you've oh, really yeah, got to... I know. Yeah, you've got to have headphones on to understand what the hell's going on. And, it, and I have listened to some of this stuff and it's just... I don't know, some weird shit like rain, you know, the old rain with a telephone conversation going on in the background, you know, that one. And then there's the right. keyboard thing, you know, the minor note keyboard thing with in the um, Dorian mode. And <laughs> you listen back, I'm listening, I'm going, guys, just stop it. Just get to the song. Okay. The song's fine. The intro sucks. <laughs> just, just get to it. Yeah. Well, and the, the other thing that I always found weird was, was uh, when you'd get these like back, even back in the nineties and stuff, you'd get these demos from bands and you'd put the cassette in and this, this amazing sounding intro with all these choirs and everything with, and then the, all of a sudden the intro and it sounds fantastic, you know, like this killer <laughs> intro will happen. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the song comes in and it's just what? Yeah. It's a grind, grind <laughs> rubbish. It, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, where did you get this intro? You wrote this intro or I don't know where you got it from, but it sounds amazing. Then all of a sudden the song starts and it's just like, Oh my God, it sounds like they recorded it, you know, with, with a radio shack microphone in the garage. Yeah. And it's like, Oh man, it just doesn't fit. Hmm. I always wanted when, when you have an intro, I want it to go into the song and feel like it's a part of the song. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's that that writing of songs by committee that you kind of alluded to a moment ago. Um, in that, if you've got different personality in the band and they all want to have their shit heard, well, it's just about where where, where you're going to tack things onto to keep people in the band satisfied and happy that their voice is being heard as opposed to what works for the song that's really common right there you can tell especially with demos we well, don't really get demos these days but first albums or you know which are really like first albums these days are like first drafts aren't they they're really just the band trying to get their shit together and trying to polish it as much as they can and and just gauge what listener response is going to be but sometimes you think yeah just just get to the point a lot of these songs that are sort of five and six minutes long could only really need to be two and three minutes long if they've if you're reusing riffs over again um unless right. you've got anything new to say you know like a couple of albums work because they're very complicated you know i know a bad metallica a bit but injustice for all works for that reason seventh son of the seventh son works for that reason um but imagine, say, if they took my – imagine, say, if Steve Harris used the same methodology on No Prayer for the Dying that he used on Seventh Son of a Seventh Son with those boring riffs that are all over No No Prayer for the Dying. Can you imagine having to listen to them for more than what we needed to? Yeah, I, well, for for me, Maiden stopped years ago, unfortunately. I, I You know, after – pretty much after peace of mind. I don't know. Oh, they right? just got kind yeah. of – kind of boring to me i mean i, I it just kind of lost something there mm. and, and i to me the i i still love the first three albums you know the first two with paul diano amazing albums the music mm. if you listen to the first iron maiden album it's a masterpiece yes musical, i mean the way the fantastic. songs flow into each other i mean there's a there's a lot going on there killers is heavier but that first Iron Maiden album is pretty amazing when you listen to how the songs flow into each other and just when you listen to it as a whole, not taking songs separately, you know, and then of course, you know, Number of the Beast is just an incredible album to me. I don't think they've ever topped that <laughs> yeah. uh, to me. Uh, those songs are just every song on that album is, is there's no filler on Number of the Beast to me. What about yeah, Gangland? That, that song. You, you like you like Gangland? Yeah, I, I like all the songs on that record. You know, <laughs> Gangland one. probably is, is 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 the only one that w- is a little bit repetitive and you know, uh, kind of commercialistic, I guess you could say, or whatever. But you know, I don't know. I just it's it's it, it. I love the first album for some reason. It's just the way it flows. You put a pair of headphones on and listen to that first Iron Maiden album, you'll get lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some, I, of that, I, some of the songs. I just found that the the jump between Dennis Stratton and Adrian Smith was so great that I really have trouble connecting at times with the first album. So I, I coming along in that I mean I'm 41, so um, I got the made in about 1990, 1991 or thereabouts, and I got into the older albums first, of course. But um, I just found I'm so, such a massive Adrian Smith fan that I just love listening to the way his guitar phrasing. The way he just – I was talking to the guitarist from, from My Dying Bride about this the other night, actually. It's, um, he just holds it for a note and a half, doesn't he? He just, he just has this beautiful way of anticipating the beat, Adrian Smith. And it's very – I know Dave's a very good rhythm player too, but never liked his solos as much as I liked Adrian's. And, and I think that's really where I connect with Maiden is being a bassist, of course, Steve. But Steve's – you can't mimic what he does. He's just got his own thing. Um, oh yeah, but Adrian's just such a wonderfully accomplished guitar player. That that real that that stunning meeting point between melody and technical prowess. Adrian is just probably the the premier example of that in my view. Yeah, I, I can agree with that for sure. He definitely has his own kind of thing going. The way he holds like holds the notes, like you say, and plays, and he just knows exactly when he makes a. Uh, more almost like sounds than notes sometimes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that's why I liked um, Somewhere in Time and Seven Suns so much. I think just, they, to be honest, mate, they actually reminded me a bit of your stuff, you know, with the keyboards and stuff. I know he was using Taurus bass pedals, Steve, at the time, but that's actually how I could connect with your stuff fairly quickly was because you had the keyboards in there. When real, I don't think any other death metal band had keyboards the way you had them. So when I heard what you were doing uh, via the key, um, I could connect with it on that basis because I'd been listening to 
Seventh Son and uh, in particular Somewhere in Time so much that it wasn't such a big jump to really understand what you were doing. Have, have you had that feedback before? Um, not not compared to that. Maiden, you know, never. That's you're the first person that's ever said something like that. Well, but okay. you know, yeah. of course, a lot of people mention about the keyboards being there. But for me, the weird thing was when I was growing up, back let's go back to the seventies. You know, listening to music. Uh, I mean, every band I listened to had keyboards in it, hmm. and and I never even thought twice about not having them. You know, and in fact, you know, just even in in the morbid stuff, there's a little bit of keyboard there. But I would have liked to have had a keyboard player even back then. It just I didn't know anybody that did that kind of stuff. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it work. I mean, if you listen to Angel Witch, the first Angel Witch album has keyboards on it all over the place. Mm-hmm. You don't hear it all the time, but it, there is they they're mixed in quite well but they're there. Mm-hmm. And, and I, to me, you know, like Zeppelin used a lot of keyboards, John Paul Jones, he, he, you know, he's an amazing bass player and keyboard player. Yeah. He's, he's an exceptional so, keyboard player. I mean, he was Led Zeppelin's, <laughs> he was Led Zeppelin's. Yeah. He Zeppelin's may be a better keyboard player, player than bass player. Yeah. To tell you the truth. He's, he's phenomenal on the keyboards and, well, and he's piano. A musical. Yeah, well, John Paul Jones is a musical genius. I don't think people understand how important he was. Without him, Led Zeppelin wouldn't have happened. Uh, and, and people need to understand that. You know, he was the arranger and the composer for a lot of that stuff. You know, Jimmy, Jimmy Page, uh, you know, I, I understand exactly what you're saying because it's the truth. People think he's a technical guitarist. No, he's not. He's a field-based guitarist. He's very different to Clapton and those guys who were emerging at about the same time who were really technically on top of it and the Al Dimiolas of the world. You know, Jimmy's really that archetypal rock god, a bit like Jimmy, Jimmy uh, Hendrix. But somebody had to make sense of all of that within the arrangement, and that man was John Paul Jones. Um, right, right. So, so, and the keyboards, I mean, who could forget Kashmir? You know, I mean, that's, there's no bass in that song, that, if I'm not mistaken. That's so, my favorite song of all time. Right there. Yeah. Well, that's a brilliant Believe track. Not. <laughs> Timeless. Well, I can understand that. I mean, listen to your music. It's bombastic. It's very ambitious. And that song is probably none more bombastic or more ambitious song ever written in rock music than that one. Certainly not for the time frame. Right. Uh, I, right, I can't think sure of anything that. else. I mean, you have to really go into Yes or or some of that other prog stuff, Pink Floyd, before you really sort of touched on it, but not from a straight up rock band. I, re- I remember when I was in high school, you know, and I had my first car, you know, before I even played drums, I remember going to work one day and at a burger place. And this mm-hmm. is, you know, before I was in, had met Trey and I heard Tom Sawyer come on the radio. <laughs> nice. That song blew my mind. The keyboards in it, the sounds the, the keyboards were making, you know, it just the drumming was so technical. You never heard anything like that before. You know, I mean, uh, you'd heard Rush before, but something happened on that record where they just stepped up to this like alien level of playing, mm. you know. <laughs> and did, and when yeah. I heard, first time I heard Tom Sawyer, just the sound of those keyboards, uh, I I just knew that I wanted to do something that had that um, atmosphere to it. There you, you go. Know? Okay, yeah. I remember reading an interview with you actually where you mentioned Rush and famously Rush never toured Australia, although they do have a fan base down here. And Rush, it's, uh, Rush, I'm actually, I've got to tell you, Rush, I'm actually saving for a bit later on in life from the perspective that I feel like once I start getting into their music, I won't stop. And, and I've kind of, and how I was introduced to Russia through King's X, I'm a massive King's X fan. And Doug Pinnock and the way Tights of War, their guitarist, another brilliant guitarist, but they're very reminiscent oh, of That is a good band. King's X, uh, King's X is a really good band. You're, yeah, incredible. I, I band. totally agree with that. Yeah. But if you really want to listen to what I like to do with Rush is, is pretty much, they've got two main, I mean, like for the older stuff. Mm-hmm. You have to take like the two, all the world's a stage and, and exit stage left those two live albums. Yep. That's all you really need. The live. Okay. I'll keep you that in those, mind. Yeah. Those two live albums and they're double albums, both of them. If you listen to both of those albums, that that's all you need as far as to be a rush fan <laughs> to mm-hmm. me, 
you know, it's like with Zeppelin, you know, like I like their recorded stuff, but man, when you listen to their live stuff and bootlegs of them, it's, it's like a whole nother world. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Do, do, I, I found some of Zeppelin's live stuff, not that crash hot. Like I know there's that infamous live aid performance that they did in 1986, sorry. Um, where Phil Collins, have you read about this? What happened to poor old Phil Collins when he's on stage and um, oh. Sheik's drummer? Yeah, I, I just recently read about that. Yeah, I, what happened with him playing drums on that. Yeah, I did read about that. Yeah, it's it's not great. I mean, and poor old Phil. I mean, Phil's a tremendous musician. You know, I, I don't think I don't think I listen to his music individually that much, but I love Genesis. I dearly love Genesis, and uh, I respect him enormously as a musician. But to get up there on stage and have to play, I mean, I I, I don't think I'm wrong in saying Jimmy just looks a bit out of it, whether he's drunk or high or both, who knows? But God, it was a messy recording, wasn't it? And poor old Phil has yeah. to sort of try to lock it down and just, you know the cheap drummer Thompson is just playing all over the top of it, trying to make his stamp because he thinks this is an opportunity to play drums for Led Zeppelin because there was talk of them reforming at the time. And Phil's just sort of got to try to lock it down with a basic 4-4 four four as best as he can on top of the very erratic playing by, uh, by Jimmy. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't have envied him to be up on stage at that particular point in time. I can assure you. Yeah. That probably was very awkward for him to have to deal with that. <laughs> Yeah, the best, the most underrated band of all time, in my view, is the Blizzard of Oz band that was behind Ozzy. So Bob Daisley, oh. Lee, Lee Kerslake, and Randy together were, were simply a machine. Um, as a muse, I was oh, like, sure. I, I, I've spoken to Bob about this because Bob's Australian. And um, I had a chat to him about 15 years ago about it. I'm like, I don't understand how you guys did that because you pretty much wrote the book for that blend of hard rock heavy metal and straight ahead rock that is still being copied to this day with what you did there. You know, I'm yep. talking about just not, not doubling up and having a rhythm guitar when the solo is going and this sort of stuff, just letting the bass handle the rhythm parts. The drumming is just all time. Yeah, like Same thing. Oh yeah. Yep. Dio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what they did there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I just love those first two albums and what Sharon's done to those musicians through the years is unconscionable. I don't know. Oh, I don't especially know when they re-record, had those guys re-record the tracks. Oh my God, I can't believe that even happened. Well, I think Robert's, Robert or Mike has expressed deep, deep from Mike Borden from Faith No More. Robert, of course, and Metallica these days. He was in Aussie's band at the time. has expressed, expressed deep remorse over doing it. But they actually said that they didn't know what they were doing. And, and those two guys are squeaky clean, right? Like, I don't think that they... I actually believe, I can't remember who, who it was, it might have been Mike Borden who said it, but I actually believe them when they say, we just thought we were just recording some stuff. We did no idea that they were going to put it on over the top of what was already there because I, I spoke to Andreas from Sepultura about it. and Look, our comments made blabbermouth, but I don't give a fuck because you can't touch the original. You can't do that. And we were both of the same view that whoever the engineer was that actually was lining everything up in Pro Tools whether they couldn't get it right or whether they just didn't get it right, it musically sounds off. I don't know whether you've heard those re-recordings. They sound wrong. That's the only way to describe it. I know. I did. I did, I have. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I remember when they did that, you know, and, and released it. I was like, "What? How could you do that to the original musicians? You know, and 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 not have a conscience like that and ruin those recordings? I mean." Randy himself must have been rolling over in his grave knowing that that was done, you know, because like you said, Curse Lake and Daisley, they were, uh, I mean, it was perfect. Those songs were perfect. Hmm. They were. There's no exactly. reason. Yeah. There's no well, reason. And, and, yeah. and then again, you know, that album is another one where when it came out, you don't really realize it, but there's keyboards all over that record. Yeah, there is. Yeah, you're right. Spot on. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, you're right. You don't realize it. And of course, there's Mr. Crowley, but there's other songs that, that, that it's in there. And keyboards were used very effectively on the next album, Bark at the Moon, which I thought was a really good album, by the way. And I think I think I'm, I, I, this might be heresy, but I actually prefer Jake over Randy, to be honest with you, as a guitarist. I just love Jake's way of doing uh. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I, I don't just know love that. Jake. I can't agree with that one because he was just a, a you gotta see the thing is when you when you talk not that jakey lee isn't a great guitar player because he's amazing but the thing is randy came up with the sound that he's using just like eddie van halen came up with the sound that he used mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, what he wrote for Ozzy, Ozzy didn't write those songs. Randy no. did. Well, Bob, Bob you wrote know? a lot of them too, yeah. Yeah, that's what people don't understand. Ozzy was high and drunk through the recording. He had no idea what the hell was going on. I mean, I think he – Bob's been very transparent about what took place back then, um, which is that – He'd help Ozzy come up. He'd sit down with Ozzy. They'd write lyrics, and Ozzy would hum some melodies. And then Bob would try to um, sort of make that work with the music that they already had going on in the background at the same time. So Ozzy was forced to play a role, but Ozzy was out of it for the first ten years of his solo career, maybe longer, fifteen yeah. years. You know, I mean, it's. I don't think he probably remembers nineteen eighty one to nineteen ninety. Um, it'd be a miracle Probably if not. he did. <laughs> it'd be a miracle, I think, if he did, because it was the musicians, like, you know, even Phil Susan, who wrote um, Shot in the Dark, um, which is probably one of my favourite songs from Ozzy. Um, and uh, Bob, of course, was there the entire time in the background writing music and writing all of the lyrics. People forget that. Right up to No More Tears. Um, he wrote five or six albums worth of lyrics there but wasn't appropriately credited for it because of the way Sharon had organised the publishing, exactly to your point earlier about siphoning off funds to people who, uh, well, I mean, I know Ozzy's the name, I get that, but for God's sakes, I think you can pay him another way and still have the actual writer of the song, if you want to credit it that way, published in the liner notes and also we, and also receiving publishing. Um, right. I, I, don't, I don't think any rock or metal fan out there is not aware at this point in time that Roz, Ozzy does not write music or lyrics. It's other people. It's Geezer and Bob Daisley that have done the lion's share of it across his 50 or 60-year yeah. career, wherever we're up to at this point. Um, and no, I'm, I, I know, but you, you'd be surprised how many people think that Ozzy oh, writes all those lyrics. Well, if you, if you read the liner notes, that's certainly what it looks like, but it just isn't the case, as we know. You know, but uh, yeah, I mean, Ozzy's, Ozzy, I, I just wish Ozzy, Ozzy seems to have a heart, and, and I wish he would sort of correct the record on some of that stuff. Um, because I think it's important for the musicians. Um, Jake looks like shit these days, you know, and um, I just hope whatever whatever he went through, he's sort of around the other side of it, you know. I, and I heard through the grapevine that there might have been some abuse issues there, substance abuse issues there too. I'm not not definitely not saying there was. I'm just saying that's what I heard. Um, yeah. But but you know, I mean, there's Randy of course is no longer around, but Phil Susan did a lot of work there. You know, uh, Randy Castillo's long gone. He's about 20 years gone these days, isn't he? Um, the drummer from that, from from the Ultimate Sin, and also um, No More Tears, um, and and I think you've got to honour these guys. I don't I don't think it's fair and reasonable not to. Like by all means, Ozzy is the name, as I say, and nobody will dispute that. Very charismatic guy on stage and all the rest of it, um, and a and a great voice too. I love the timber and the sound of his voice. But these are the guys that were in the engine room making his band happen. Right. Yep. You know, so cool, mate. All right, look, I better jet off. I better go and see what these kids are doing. So, in case they've pulled apart the living room and uh, broken the TV, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you'll get it back uh, together. You'll be all right. Yeah, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. But uh, look, thanks for your time. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, uh, you know, at- it doesn't happen that often. So I, I, I'm glad we got a good long session in and got to talk about a bunch of stuff. And you got tons of stuff you can use now. Well, if you're cool with it, mate, I just put everything up as it is because I, I find that most of my audience, unbelievably, is in your your part of the world. There, I've got hardly anybody in Australia that listens to me. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> I see it's in the US, the US and Europe. Yeah, people oh, yeah, yeah. I'm fine with anything so, we we talked about. You know. Yeah, so I just put it. up. I think authenticity rules. So I just put it up as it is. I don't really even do much editing. Um, I actually, I don't, I can assure you, I don't do any editing. I've got to say, I just put it up and that's it. Um, and I find I get so many messages from people, um, just saying that they appreciate it because they like just hearing, they like basically eavesdropping in in the conversation between two blokes, especially since you're, you're right. the star of the show, so to speak. So they're, they're tuning in to listen to you, but I've also got an inbuilt audience too, that are very keen to sort of listen to people like yourself who've had such a tremendous impact. And, and I've got to say, not just on extreme music, I think you've had a, a, a tremendous uh, impact on music in general and you'll never know how much of an impact you've had because you know you fly under the radar a little bit but you really are one of those guys that without your contribution to music in general I think it would sound very differently and and I want you to know that you're a very very important guy very important guy to the history of music 
I appreciate that, but I, you know, it's so weird for me to think of things that way. I just never do. I always think of myself as just another metalhead that just enjoys the music and likes to play it, you know. Mm. And and I, I like to do my own thing, and I don't really take off of, of what other people do. I mean, I have a lot of things that I listen to, but you can hear some influences here and there, but. I don't know where it comes from, but it just, it's, I kind of just do my own thing. And, and it, and it just kind of, like I said, it's almost like when I play shows too, it, it just kind of comes out, you know, sometimes I'll with the lyrics too. I, so I'll have a, the story in mind, you know, a little synopsis of everything that goes with the song title, but sometimes I'll literally sit down and just, it just comes out like it just pours out like mm. in an hour, the whole song, bam, you know, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what uh, I said for the review for, for Paradox last year when it came out, because I did a review on my, I've got a couple of websites, but one of them's the A-List online, and I said, I said uh, the great Mike Branning returns with a worthy follow-up to the supreme masterpiece, The Key. Branning is an enigma wrapped in a riddle, a key collaborator with the very young Trey Zagtoth in Morbid Angel. His vocals and drum work were, the cru- were crucial in the development of the death metal genre, Paradox proves that Browning is a significant and enduring voice in the music biz. There you go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. You know. So it's just a weird. Like I said, I don't think about myself that way. I just kind of, you know, I just kind of take things in the moment and do them mm. in a chaotic way. And then, then I sit back and look at it. And sometimes I'm like, I, I, I don't even know where some of this stuff comes from. You know, yeah. I look back and look at some of the stuff that I've written, lyric wise too, especially, you know, and go, where did I come up with this? You know, <laughs> how did yeah. I come up with this idea? I don't even know, you know how it happened, you know, but it, there it is. So it did happen, but I'm like, okay, you know, but it, it's, a, you know, I still just consider myself because I am a, a metalhead, you know, and, mm. and, and I've always been one and, 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 you know, probably be one till the day I end up dying. So mm. <laughs> and as long as I can brother. make music, <laughs> if I, as long as I can make music, I'll be doing what I do because I don't think I've changed that much over the years. What I do, you know, mm-hmm. it's just been, it's been the same, but different, you know, yeah. it's like a, it's a, it's a long continuance of, mm. of one thing almost. It seems well, like I think it's very you're strange. born to do it. Well, you're, you're born to do it. You clearly got the talent for it. You know, you you found your muse early on in life, and you've just been mining it ever since. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, it's a real, it's a real positive thing, particularly because of your impact on this on, on music in general. You know, so I just hope you. You know, I'm really looking forward to listening to the new music you've got to release. That's for sure. Um, I'm really enjoying yeah, Paradox. It's but kind of strange. Yeah. It's good. It, it's definitely going to be in the vein of Paradox, still, of course. Mm. Um, but some of the timings of the, these newer songs, these new four songs that we've got is just really strange. I don't even know how to count some of it myself. I'd have to have somebody <laughs> that's really good with drums go, oh, that's the seven, eight timing or something, you know, oh, I'm like, it stuff, yeah. could be this or it could be that. I'm not even sure of, of some of the weird stuff, you know, that I come up with and timing wise, but we got some very strange rhythms and timings to them and mm. changes this time. So it's gotten a little weirder for sure mm. yeah for sure but it's definitely going to be um you know just like a paradox continuance for sure because uh, i think we've, we've got found a niche that we really like with paradox and, mm. and you know we want to make sure we don't get too far away from that but still make it fresh yeah, yeah. Well, I just say, man, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, and I'm so it's such a it's great to hear that you're continuing along in that vein because the the video that you did too was fantastic. You know, I thought you really nailed it with the video. The aesthetics were on point. It's good to see you guys and the band members up there on you know in in front of the uh, the green screen or whatever you were playing in front of. Um, yep, yep put, that was a green yeah, screen. Yep. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's great. I think it's good for people to to put a face to the name and that you're representing all of the band members. I mean. I think a lot of other people in your position would just have a video of yourself playing along to it. But uh, no, true to your word, mate, you, you do have a, a very good band there, and it is a band in the truest sense of the word. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, with the video thing, you know, I've seen some people make some comments, oh, I, the, the beginning was awesome, and then I see these old guys playing instruments, and it's like, yeah, what? Yeah, I saw that you as know? well, yeah. Don't worry about that shit, though. Yeah, that's what they say. 
it's like, dude, we're old because I'm 55 years old. I'm almost 56. What do you want? <laughs> but are you doing anything? What are you doing besides yeah. criticizing my age? <laughs> and what were you doing when I, in 1986 when I was recording Abominations? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mate, you've earned the right to do whatever the hell you want. Put it that way, mate. And and, and anonymous <laughs> keyboard warriors be damned. <laughs> you know, um, if, if to your exact point, mate, they can go out there and start their own band, and then they can do exactly whatever they want to do. But you know, it's really up to them and, to, and their prerogative to get off their asses and do it. Right. Exactly. You know, and a lot of people can talk, you know, about oh, well, this or that. You know. Uh, but it's like really success is, is, is your only proof. What, what you can talk a lot of stuff, but what are you actually doing? Mm-hmm. You know? And, and that's what it comes down to is what you end up, you know, putting out to the world, mm-hmm. not what you say to the world that's what you do in the world. You know, that's the only thing that's going to live on your, you, you know, you can say and criticize all kinds of people and say, Oh, uh, you know, this person's not as good as this person as far as playing the drums or whatever, but it, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, indeed, yeah. No, oh, that's it, mate. Yeah. All right. Look, I better go off and see these kids and get some lunch organized for them and stuff. So, but look, I want to thank you very much again, mate. When, when I've done the edit or, you know, put everything together for a podcast, when I posted it, do you, do you yeah, want me to send, you, send it through to you on messenger? And once we record again and get a new thing out, then we'll do it again. If you, you know, we'll, do a whole nother situation. Want to do it. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna have a final point, man. Anytime you want to have a chat about anything, mate. I know there's plenty of people out there that love hearing from you. So anytime you want to chat and you know you want to do a podcast episode or what have you, mate, just let me know. I'm, I'm down to chat about anything. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah, cool. For sure. All right, brother. Thanks so much again. I eh? appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And there, there'll be more to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, brother. Talk to you soon. All right. Alright, Bye. What a fantastic fella. Mike Browning from Nocturnus AD and Morbid Angel, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, if you like that one, there are quite a few more chats with the Morbid Angel members and associated alumni over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading. I know you do, because you're an intelligent audience. Check out my book, please, and there's some more information to share with you about the book but before we get to that i'll bid you a fond farewell my name's andrew mckay smith and i'm the host of the scars and guitars podcast until next time it's a very goodbye for now this is eric rattan of cannibal corpse you are listening to the scars and guitars podcast with andrew mckay smith i've been the host of the scars and guitars podcast since 2017 the first musician i interviewed for the show was david vincent from morbid angel and things have just snowballed from there In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Coal Chamber, and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the... I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this 
idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was he was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.